Uh, Frank said he got here about two minutes ago, so let's just go in. Okay, guys, come on. What are you doing here? I wanted to get a shot of you arriving at work. I thought this was going to be just an interview. Oh, it is, but I thought it would be nice to open with you starting your day. Would you mind taking another sip of coffee? Yes, I would. Harry, we finally got a response from those people that harbored. What's going on? A very good question. I think we can cut here. You ready? Mr. Mason, is there any kind of client that you wouldn't handle? Yes. One who lied to me. Harry, I got that. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. Excuse me. Mr. Melansky and I need a moment alone. Of course. I got Williamson's statement, but I don't think it's going to help our case much. Young lady, your interview, this interview, is over. I do not want you disrupting my office. I'm just trying to add a dimension of reality, sort of um, television verite, if you know what I mean. Look, Charlie, it is Charlie, isn't it? Yes, it is. Check with Miss Street. Make a date for me to come to your station. I'll do as long a law day interview as you wish. Okay. Can I still use the footage I took today? Damn it, girl. Mr. Mason, I, I realize that we're intruding, but I, I'm really trying to go for sort of a naturalistic thing, you know? And uh, I, I do keep my word. I won't use any footage unless you approve first, okay? That's a wrap. Okay, folks, stand by. Uh, bring up camera right for me, would you, Phil? Uh, tighten that up a little bit. Yeah, that's nice right there. Hold it. Thanks. Jeff, when can I get some time in here to do some online? Uh, maybe tonight. Uh, I'll let you know. Thanks. Okay. okay, let's do this. And now, Rand Cosmetics once again brings you the whole truth, as revealed by the one, the only, Ted May. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thanks very much. And to everyone at home watching our live show today, welcome. Today, the spotlight of Revelations falls on Judge Joshua Cohn. Now, I invited the good judge here today to discuss a certain weekend he's rumored to have spent recently at a law conference in Los Angeles, but he declined. Oh. However, I did manage to track down someone who was at that alleged conference with him. Please welcome his alleged research assistant. This is Miss Carrie McCloskey. Carrie. Oh. Welcome. I love your outfit. Have a seat there, Carrie. Now, Carrie, this research that you did for the judge down in L.A., just exactly what kind of briefs did it entail, anyway? <laughs> he is the first really bona fide hit I've had since I started this network. <laughs> he does get away with murder, doesn't he? Yes, he <laughs> does. God love him. And he hasn't done too badly by you, either. Sponsoring a show is one of the two best decisions I've ever made. The second was to become engaged to him. Makes his contract negotiations a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, you've been a great guest today. I want to thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Carrie McCloskey, Judge Cohen's girl, Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Carrie, thank you. Before we close today's show, I have an announcement, a very important announcement. It's here. Everything you wanted to know about me, Ted Maine, but we're afraid to ask, has finally been revealed. Yes, indeed. The truth is out, and not just the truth about me. 
and my many thrilling adventures, but also about some special women I've known and loved before, all in intimate detail. So whether it's the famous star of her own TV series, and I'm referring, of course, to the lovely Roxanne Shields, the star of the hit TV series, Undercover. Another special lady in my life is the widow of a celebrated congressman, Mrs. Nora Turner. Turnabout's fair play, and now the sometimes harsh spotlight of truth falls on me. So whether I tell you all about my romance with a high fashion photographer, or whether it's closer to home and you get to meet a sophisticated and beautiful television producer, I can only warn you that if you pick up this book, you won't put it down. It's all true, it's all in here, and it all goes on sale tomorrow. So you've been a great audience. This is Ted Main saying, watch yourself, because we just may be watching you too. See you tomorrow. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Were you aware he even had a book? Not me. You're his producer. You didn't know about this? No. You must have known. Oh, I read the galley. You read the galleys. You're going to marry him. How can you let him publish a kiss and tell book? But it all happened before we met, so why should I care? Besides, this should push his ratings and my company's sales to an all-time high. Uh, if you two will excuse me, I'm going to go congratulate our star. So tell me, what does he say about me? Plenty. SOB. Yes, but he's our SOB. <gasps> oh, Perry Mason. It's very big time stuff. Almost as big a deal as this. Or haven't you heard about my autobiography yet? The United Nations was all a buzz. <laughs> Came by to bring you a very own copy. Check it out, it's a good read. Oh, that's very nice of you, Ted, but I haven't finished reading Mine Come. Read it, Charlie, tonight, because tomorrow you're going on special assignment interviewing all the women I've known and loved. <laughs> Ted, I don't know if you've forgotten, but I don't work for you. You do this time. Says who? Harold Tyson. You remember Harold, the man who signs your paychecks? Ted, I'm doing this piece on Perry Mason. Cool down, Charlie. Mason can wait. This just became the hottest story in show business. I really like your show. Oh, thank you. Have you read Ted Main's book? No, I haven't. Are you going to? Um, I have much better things to do with my time. Roxanne, how do you feel about Ted Main? What? The next time I see him, I'm gonna ramp this for his rotten little heart! Roxanne, don't you just leave me alone, us. okay? When David died in that plane crash, well, it was quite a blow for me and my daughter. Sandra had school, of course, so she recovered fairly quickly. Why are you talking to them? Can't you just leave her alone? Let's cut. I want to have my say. This is important to me. Go ahead, Mrs. Turner. Anyway, after David's death, I became a virtual recluse. Then about two years ago, I met Ted. In a way, he brought me back to life. So are you saying you're glad you had your affair with him? In hindsight, no, of course not. But at the time, he was very supportive. 
I was vulnerable. And you might say that he took advantage of me. I had no idea that he'd end up sharing our relationship with the world. That's all I have to say. Excuse me. Make sure you get a shot of that picture of her and Turner over there. Okay. I'll see you back at the station. All right. Hi, Beth, it's me. Um, listen, did you have any luck finding that fashion photographer, Mary Singer? Well, she's got to be somewhere. Where does she know me from? A hotel. Great. Well, did you try this hotel? Uh-huh. Okay, well, I got to go. Keep, keep trying, okay? Okay, bye. Promise me. I need it. I've spent my life getting permission from people. I don't intend to get it from you. Mom, I'm only trying to help. I'm sorry. I'm mad at Ted May, not you. Maybe I can repay him someday. This is my Miss Passion. Let's use our first, okay? And this is number two. And make sure you get the champagne glasses in this one. And this is a hot ticket. Oh. You are not gonna use that picture. Brenda, sweetheart, it's just a blob of what's already in the book. I don't care. How could you do this to me? Where's your sense of humor? I went out with you, didn't I? <gasps> Ted. Oh, hi, babe. Something's come up. Why the long face? You better see. Next time I see him, I'm gonna have this for his rotten little heart. Roxanne, don't. So Nora Turner gave me this hearts and flowers routine, and Mary Singer is nowhere to be found. But I think that Roxanne makes up for them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought you'd better know. This book is gonna bring you nothing but trouble, and it serves you right. When are you gonna stop being such a spoil sport? Besides, this is great stuff. In fact, I want to use a clip from that for my show today. Ted, she threatened you. You've got to be careful. In fact, I think maybe we should hire a bodyguard. Roxanne's not really capable of doing anything. You never know. I vote for the bodyguard. Everybody gets something straight. I've been in the news business 20 years. I've covered 12 wars, 2,000 stories. I've always watched my own back. I'm not going to start running scared because some hysterical woman threatens me with a Boy Scout knife. I want a clip from that up to the booth because I'm running it on my show today. Okay? Excuse me. stand out. You think so? How long have I been working for you? I know so. <laughs> Listen to this. I've had six people ask me if you're really going to kill Ted Maine. Two of them volunteered to do it for you. You know, my agent's always telling me to get involved with something environmental. So I figured killing Ted would be right up there with saving the ozone layer, don't you? Tell me when you're going to do it. I'll hold his arms. What a creep playing that tape on a show like that. I guess that's what I get for being involved with him, right? Uh, what time is it? 5.30. I'm going to lie down for a little while. I've got an evening premiere and a 6 a.m. call. Life is hard, Annie. 
Yeah, and all you get in return is fame and fortune. I'll press this before I go. Thanks. Oh, and can you tell him to hold all my calls and wake me up at 8? Got you. Give my regards to your sister. Thanks. something? No, I just thought I saw someone I know come in here. Maybe I can help you, man or woman. <laughs> no, that's okay. Do I know you from someplace? Never mind. I, I must have made a mistake. Thank you. Roxanne. Now, how would you know that? You get to be my age, you know just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a pleasant surprise. I knew you weren't mad. Come on in, I'll make you drink. Scotch knee, right? So what's with the scarf? It's not that cold out, is it? Any chance the lady in the red dress you saw getting off the elevator? I suppose it could have been. No, Arnie, it must have been that's rough sand. She had on a scarf. Yeah, and but Arnie, the perfume, remember? Excuse the me, perfume? excuse me. What about the perfume? Well, she was wearing this perfume, right? That she sells. It's called Roxanne. Arnie recognized it. Well, is that right, Arnie? I never forget a scent. Take your coat off yet. Why not? You just had a call from your TV friend, Roxanne Shields. Oh, you know. You sent her an invitation to the charity dinner. Of course she accepted. She's just been arrested for murder. She was calling from the police station. I mean, look, I, I admit being mad at Ted. I mean, who wouldn't be? The guy described every sexual encounter we ever had in graphic detail. 
never been so mad at anyone my whole life. Witnesses say the killer was wearing a red dress and the perfume you endorse. I was getting ready to go to the premiere. And unfortunately, my assistant Annie was already on her way to Cleveland and can't confirm my whereabouts. Any idea how the killer could have known that you would be wearing a red dress? Hug. Oh, I don't know. I wear a lot of red. Maybe they just got lucky. Maybe. You know, I'm curious. Why did all those women find Maine so, so... Because... Because I... Guess he was a very good actor. He, um... He made you believe that you were very special. And that he loved you. Sorry, I'm late. Roxanne is my associate, Ken Malatsky. Roxanne Shields. Nice to meet you. I just talked to Brock. They found the murder weapon, a knife. It was identical to the one Miss Shields used in that videotape. They found it in the trunk of your car. Oh, come on! How stupid do they think I am? Can't they tell that this is a frame? Miss Shields, I'm afraid they see it more like an airtight case. Particularly after what I said on television. God, how could I have been so stupid? You know, a friend of mine once told me that he figured I became an actress because I had a hard time handling reality. Oh, boy, was he right. Please, you, you got to help me with this. I mean, I, I've never been so scared in my life. ever comes to trial. Do you have anything you'd like to say to me, Roxanne? You bet I do. I but would like to be here. You work too hard. Roxanne, we You heard what Mr. Mason said. Uh, I was talking to her. Roxanne? Excuse me. Hey. I said excuse me. Where were you? Where were you? So where to? Ted Main's apartment. We'll drop you off first. Somebody? Uh, yeah, my name's Ken Melansky, and this is... Harry Mason. I've, I've got a thing for faces. Jamie Morsey, how you doing? We have permission to examine Mr. Main's apartment. Go right ahead. Oh, no, no. you got to use the uh, penthouse elevator over there. All right, thanks. Mr. Morrissey, you mentioned in your statement to the police that you saw a woman in a red dress get on the elevator. That's right. The penthouse elevator? Yeah. Did she seem to know where it was? Went straight to it. Did you see anyone else you didn't recognize down here that night? As a matter of fact, there was somebody. A guy, kind of tall, dark, good-looking, but mean-looking, too. Uh, I know him from someplace. Like I said, I got this thing for faces. Why didn't you mention that in your statement? Police never asked. They just wanted to know about the woman. Thank you, Mr. Morrissey. Well, there's nothing in here that wasn't in the police report. Ken, I, I've seen this place before, and I'm not talking about the photos taken by the police. Take a look in Maine's book, The Pictures. This picture of Roxanne, it was taken in here. Right there on the couch. That's right.
What a sleaze. Yep. The system was put in to record his meetings with mobsters. He probably figured out the other uses for the camera later on. A lot of those pictures were taken in here. And unless Maine brought those women up here blindfolded, all of them would know where that elevator was. The killer could be one of them. I've already asked Ella to do some background research on those ladies. Her birthday's coming up, you know. I know. What are you going to get her? I'm keeping that a secret. You mean you don't know yet? I'm also keeping that a secret. Thanks. Here's the idea. Roxanne Shields has Perry Mason, one of the most successful defense attorneys anywhere, right? The police have their suspect. They've made their case. They're through. But meanwhile, Mason is out looking for anything he can find to help get his client off. All he needs to show is reasonable doubt. Which is a pretty tall order in this case. Yes, but not impossible. Especially not for Mason. All right, so just what is it you are proposing? Let me run an investigation parallel to Mason's. I'll be on top of everything he finds. We can keep the prosecution up to speed on what he's got. And that way we will have a pretty hot story. I am not at all certain about the ethics of this thing. Laura, I'll defer to you. I knew the real Ted Maine, not just the showman. Everybody thought that was all there was to him. I loved him. Um, I don't want Perry Mason to get Roxanne Shields off if she's guilty. But if she didn't do it, I'd sure as hell like to know who did. I think we should do it. <sighs> okay, Michelle, we got the party scene, we got the restaurant scene, we got the living room. I wonder if her orange dress is going to clash with those red and white tablecloths, but... I'm Ms. Kingsley, I'm Roxanne Shields' attorney. My name's Mason. Do you have time for some questions? Of course. You want to give me just about five minutes? So, questions about Ted and me? Basically, yes. Well, why don't you just read his book? I did. I take it your relationship was short-lived. Well, I discovered fairly quickly he liked a lot of ladies. And I didn't like that. You still produce his show. I produce several shows here. My personal feelings don't enter into it. You were angry when you learned that you were in the book? I was upset, yes. You had a very angry public argument with him the day he was murdered. Well, he wanted to use my picture in the show he was doing that day on his book. I objected. Where were you between 8 and 9 o'clock that night? I was right here, going over costumes for a special that I'm producing. Ever wear red, Miss Kingsley? Rarely. But if you wanted to wear red, a dress, for instance, you'd know right where to come, wouldn't you? Yep. Hey, Della. Any messages? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here they are. Thanks. Oh, uh, Perry wants you to look at what I found on Mary Singer. It's in his office. All right. Where's the rest of it? That's it. 
You know, in his book, Ted Maine described her as a high-fashion photographer he met at the Regis Hotel. No agency's ever heard of her. Did you check the agencies in New York? Chicago, Los Angeles, everywhere. It's like she didn't exist. Well, Ted Maine sure is kissing somebody in this picture. <laughs> if her real name is Mary Singer, I'll eat my hat. If I had one. the outfit. You're trying to get into another book. Don't be cute, Polly. Where have you been? Don't worry about it. If I'm supposed to let you know my every move, then I'd like to know yours. Just leave it alone. What are you up to? What's the gun for? It's none of your business. Because of what you did, sooner or later they're going to come looking. And when they do, I'm going to be ready. Sweet. Look what just came. I'd like you to get a knife just like that one. And then what? And then another, and another, and another. And maybe even one more. Uh, I think I can do that. Soon. star Roxanne Shields. Now we go live to Charlie Adams at the courthouse. Roxanne Shields is free today after posting bail of $100,000. Though no one will comment, rumor has it the fact that Ms. Shields was wearing red last night is central to the state's case. The woman seen entering Ted Maine's apartment an hour before he was found murdered was also wearing red. And this is apparently too much of a coincidence. Sandra, I'm Roxanne Shields' attorney. I have an appointment to see your mother. Um, I don't think she's here. I just got back myself. My name is Mason. Mind if I ask you some questions? Um, all right. Come on in. What do you want to ask me about? This, mostly. Where'd you get this? We never distributed these. Well, there's been a lot of speculation that your mother would run for your father's seat. That's been canceled. Ted Maine pretty well took care of any political future my mother had, didn't he? She just started to get her life back together, and then he came along and tore it apart. Was your mother home the night he was murdered? She was at home with me. So? 
You both have an alibi. You have each other. Tell your mother I'll call again. Thank you for your help. I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to give out that kind of information. Ah, uh, come on, I'm investigating a murder here. You're not a cop, and you don't have a subpoena. Well, subpoenas take time. I'm after a killer, Hillary, and the longer we stand here talking, the colder the trail gets. Look, I'd like to help you, but... All I want is Mary Singer's address. That's all, I swear. All right, do you have any idea when she registered? Sometime last June, I think. Okay, hold on a sec. Singer. Mary Singer. I really appreciate this, Clarence. Anytime you want to come down and see a taping or whatever, you just let me know, okay? What are you doing here? I remember you. You're the guy who pushes people around for Perry Mason. What, what was your name again? Molansky. Ken Molansky. So why are you asking about Mary Singer? I have a nose for news. <laughs> Seriously, what do you want with her? The same thing you do. You're that reporter Charlie Adams, aren't you? Are you two together? No. no. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any records of a Mary Singer. Okay, thanks anyway. So, well, I guess that's it for here, huh? I guess so, yeah. See you around, Molanski. We'll have somebody up here me. Well, thank you. Do you remember seeing this woman? <sighs> Looks familiar. She was here last June. Well, it's a long time and a lot of people ago, my friend. I remember her. Beautiful woman, always acting mysterious. And boy, did she love the shop. Every time she came back, it took at least two of us to get all of her bags up to her room. As a matter of fact, she was here, um... Three times last year? Yeah, I remember her. Was she ever here with anybody? No, she was always alone. You remember anything else? She did a lot of shopping at Riddell's. Try that. All right, thanks a lot. My pleasure. That's right. Mr. Mason, were you looking for me? Yes. Your office has been very reluctant to make an appointment. I really don't have anything to say to you, Mr. Mason. Perhaps you'd answer just one question. What is that? When did you first read the galleys of Ted Main's book? <laughs> Why do you ask? My office spoke to Maine's publisher and got the exact date the galleys came out. Three days later, your company took out a $5 million insurance policy on Maine. Uh, what are you getting at? That book really upset you, didn't it? How dare you imply such a thing? I love Ted Maine, and we were going to be married. I think you are beneath contempt, Mr. Mason, so I will thank you to leave me alone. Do you hear me? Ms. Wren. I hear you, Ms. Wren. And so does everyone else. Don't they? So what kept you? Well, look who's here. Look, there's no point in us tripping over each other. Why don't we call it a truce and see if we can help each other out? We're both after the same thing. We are? Yeah, the truth. Um, well, you know, I thought you and Mason were just interested in getting your client off. Well, in this case, our client happens to be innocent. Well, that remains to be seen. 
So are you coming or not? Give me one good reason. Well, you remember when you asked that salesman in there where you delivered something to Mary Singer? I told him to give you the wrong address. I got the right one here. That's one good reason. Miss Shields will be right with you. Thank you. Your relatives in Cleveland, how are they? Fine, thanks. Why? Well, you told Miss Shields you were going to Cleveland to visit them the night of the murder. You didn't make the trip. <sighs> Look, Mr. Mason, I was supposed to work the weekend, but I wanted to spend some time with my boyfriend, so I lied. Do you have to tell Miss Shields? No. But I am interested in where you were the night of the murder. We were at a party. There's a dozen people can swear I was there all night. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Mason. Annie, have you gotten my prescription from the drugstore yet? I'll do it right after I take care of this. Excuse me. May I see your bedroom? My bedroom? Yep, your bedroom. What are you looking for? How the killer could have known what you were wearing. I was hoping there was a building across here so someone could have seen you dressed in red. Have you thought about what you're wearing to court? Good. So, Malansky, what do you want to be when you grow up? I can be half as good as Perry Mason. How about you? I'm good now. I'm just waiting for the world to recognize it. You're certainly giving him every opportunity. I thought maybe you were going to be the next Ted Mayne. You know, Ted Mayne used to be a damn good journalist. One of the best. Shouldn't that place be around here somewhere? Five, nine, eight, three, five, nine, eight, seven. Nine, eight, nine. This can't be it. Mary Singer. No, I'm afraid I've never heard of her. But, Reverend, she had a freezer delivered to this address that was just last November. A freezer? This is a church, not a restaurant. Well, you have a kitchen maybe she donated in? I don't know anything about any freezer or about this Mary Singer. I wish she had given us a freezer. We could use it. <laughs> Sorry. The people at the store must have given me the wrong address. Let's try the parcel service office. Thank you, Reverend. Yeah, thanks. This is Reverend Leary. Someone was just here asking about Mary Singer. There it is. Ah, there's no place to park. Look, you stay here. I will be right back. All right. Mary Singer? Mm -hmm. I found her credit card. I'm trying to return it to her. Why don't you just turn it over to the police? Because the police won't give me a reward. Okay. Mary and Paul Singer, 7920 Valley Way. Thank you very much. You bet. Identification, please. Well, you mind telling me what this is all about? This car's been reported stolen. What? What are you talking about? Just keep your hands where I can see them. Well, my wallet's in my right hand pocket. Do you mind if I get it? Okay. Charlie, run! 
They caught me. Go ahead, run. Get out of here. Please get her. Hey, hey, hey. All right. Your other hand. Don't come in. What do you mean, don't come in? Ken just called. Good. Where is he? In jail. Jail? Mm hmm. Little place about 40 miles from here called Georgetown. The police chief is waiting for your call. I'd like to speak to the chief of police, please. The name's Mason. Yes, I'll hold. Do you happen to know the best escort service in town? Not right offhand. Would you find out for me? Mm -hmm. You can use my phone. Oh. Yes. There you go, Bill. Thanks a lot, Miss Adams. My my wife will be thrilled. And again, I I'm sorry about the mix-up. Oh, that's okay. These things happen. I called a cab for you. It's waiting outside. How sweet of you. Thank you. Where's Mr. Molanski? Uh, he's, um, he's still in the tank. The chief's on the phone checking out his story. Well, I guess I better be going. <laughs> thanks for everything. It was nice to meet you all. Oh, thanks. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. person who's come in here today asking about her yeah i know in fact that first woman you know the pushy one uh -huh. she's my girlfriend oh, why didn't you just ask her for the address she lost it can you believe it she is such a flake anyway she was too embarrassed to come back here so she sent me story of my life okay charlene adams charlie adams paul she's that reporter you're gonna scream what are you doing here? Don't move. Paul! Paul, in the back door! Nobody's there. Handle. Hold it right there. Drop it. 
Now. Knife, too. You okay, Paulie? Yeah, I'm okay. Paulie. Paul Danton, the mobster. Shut up! What are you waiting for? Get rid of him. Let me see. State your name, please. Susan Reardon. And what is your occupation? I'm a medical examiner employed by the county. In your professional capacity, did you perform a post-mortem examination of Ted Maine? Yes, I did. Have you established the time of death? Approximately between 8.15 and 8.30 on the evening of the 19th. Will you please tell the court the cause of death? Ted Maine was killed with a knife wound in the chest, which punctured his aorta. Have you had the opportunity to examine this knife marked State Exhibit B? Yes, I have. Did you find blood traces on this knife? Yes. Were you able to determine if the blood on this knife matches Ted Maine's? Yes, it does. No further questions. At about 7.30 the morning after the murder, we responded to a call from the supervisor of uh, Ted Maine's building. And who discovered Mr. Maine's body? Uh, the maid had come in to clean, and she saw the body um, lying on the carpet. Did you interview the defendant that morning? Well, yes, I did. What prompted you to do that? Well, well she had publicly uh, threatened him with bodily harm. Could the defendant account for her whereabouts at the time of the murder? Well, she stated that she was in her apartment alone. I call your attention to State's Exhibit B. Do you recognize it? Yes, it has my mark on it. Mm -hmm. When did you first see this knife, Lieutenant? Uh, that morning. It was in the trunk of Miss Shields' car. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions. She came out of the elevator and she went straight toward Mr. Maine's apartment. Did you get a good look at her? Yes, I did. At least I got a good look at what I could see of her. What do you mean, Mr. Wyman? Well, she was all bundled up, kind of like the way she is now. That's the woman you saw that night? The defendant? Yes, yes it is. Aside from the way she was dressed, did you notice anything else about her? Well, yes, uh, she was wearing Roxanne. You know, the perfume. Are you an expert on perfumes, Mr. Wyman? Well, somewhat. Uh, I like women, you see, and at my age, in order to enjoy their company, I often have to throw what you might call perks into the relationship. Perks? Yeah, you know, flowers, champagne, perfumes, that sort of thing. And as a result, I know my flowers, I know my champagnes, and I know my perfumes. So you're sure that the woman you saw that night was wearing Roxanne? Absolutely. No more questions. Mr. Mason. Defense has no questions, Your Honor. Next witness. Uh, the state calls Mr. James Morrissey. You're excused. About how far away from her were you when you saw her? About 30 feet. Saw her clear as a bell. And do you see that woman in this courtroom today? Yes, sir. She's right there. Let the record show that the witness pointed to the defendant. How was your eyesight, Mr. Morrissey? 2020. You don't wear contacts or glasses? No, sir. And you are absolutely certain it was the defendant you saw that night? Yes, sir. Your witness. What time did you see this woman, Mr. Morrissey? About 8 o'clock. And how was the woman you saw dressed? Just like she is now. What color were her eyes? Well, I don't know. She was wearing dark glasses, like she's got on now. What color was her hair? Red. But if she was wearing a scarf, how could you tell? Are you just assuming her hair was red because Roxanne Shields' hair is red? Look, all I know is that's the woman I saw that night. And you are sure? Positive. Are you sure it wasn't that woman? Or what about that woman? Or could it have been this woman? 
Well? No. It was her. I'm positive. Would you mind? Let the record show that this witness, like Mr. Wyman before him, has identified not Roxanne Shields, but Jenny Tessier, an employee of a local escort service. Roxanne Shields is the woman now standing in the rear of the courtroom. No further questions. Della, any word from Ken? Uh -uh, not yet. I'm worried. So am I. Mr. Mason? Yes? We'd like to talk. See you back in the office. Everything's fine. Yes, he is. He worked with you? Yes, he does. Why are you holding him? Because he and the young lady have stumbled onto two people we have in the witness protection program. We found Mary Singer and her brother. His real name's Paul Danton. She's his sister, Marie. They're both due in court this summer to give key testimony on some top organized crime people. As you can imagine, your finding them causes us some problems. I'm sorry for any inconvenience. But I need both witnesses in court tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Now, wait a minute. That would require us to relocate them with new identities. My client is on trial for murder. Their testimony will be important. I'd like them in court at 9 o'clock. You've got a lot of nerve, Mr. Mason. I wouldn't think you'd want it publicized on television how these two young people found your protected witnesses. I'll have them there. Now, where's the young lady? Mary arranged for your release. Right. Thought we were supposed to be in this together. I didn't think I could trust you. Well, right now, the only thing I know for sure is that I can't trust you. Is there more to this lecture? No. Uh, Your Honor, uh, page 94. Page 94, Mr. Prosecutor. Uh, Ms. Danton, you have in your hand a copy of Ted Main's book, opened to page 94. Would you identify the woman in the picture, please? It's me. I told Ted my name was Mary Singer and that I was a fashion photographer because I obviously couldn't tell him my real name. When was that picture taken? Last year in June. When you saw your picture in Ted Main's book, what was your reaction? I was scared. I was afraid my brother's enemies would recognize me and eventually trace us to our new home. Were you angry? <laughs> yes, mostly at myself. Where were you the evening of March 19th? Objection. Relevancy. Miss Stanton is not on trial here. Your Honor, the state contends that my client is guilty in large part because she had a motive for killing Ted Maine and an alibi that cannot be substantiated. I intend to show that she is not the only person who meets those criteria. Overruled. Witness is instructed to answer the question. I was home in Georgetown that night. With your brother? No. You were alone. My brother came back at 8 o'clock. 
How can you be so sure of the time? I was watching TV and I switched to a program I wanted to see. No further questions? No questions. Defense calls Mr. Paul Danton. How did you feel when you saw that picture, Mr. Danton? I was mad as hell. At whom? My sister. And that creep Maine for telling the world stuff any normal man would have kept himself. Where were you the evening of the 19th? Objection. Mr. Mason calls everybody who had a reason to dislike Ted Maine to the stand. We could be here for months. Your Honor. Yes, I know. Objection overruled. Witness will answer the question, please. I was out driving around. You ended up in the lobby of Ted Maine's apartment building, did you not? The concierge of that building is sitting right back over there. Now, you remember him? You do remember him. Yeah, I was there that night. And what did you do while you were there? Nothing. I never got the chance. He saw me, so I left. What did you intend to do? I'll take care of business. Kill him? Objection. He's badgering the witness. Overruled. Mr. Mason? Did you want to kill him? He wasn't worth it. You didn't slip in later when Mr. Morrissey's back was turned? No, I went home. On your way home, you stopped at a convenience store in Idaho Springs, a town over 20 miles from your house, did you not? Yeah, to pick up cigarettes, odds and ends. Well, then I stopped for a beer. So what? Are you aware that later on that evening there was a holdup in that store? I read about it in the paper. Now, the police have supplied us with a copy of the surveillance tape of the night of the robbery. It shows that you were there at 8.30. If necessary, I can introduce it into evidence. What's your point? The tape proves you couldn't have been home by 8 o'clock, as your sister testified. It's over half an hour from town to Idaho Springs. That proves I couldn't have killed Maine. The tape gives me an alibi. Exactly my point. You have an alibi. But your sister does not. No further questions. No questions. Defense calls Brenda Kingsley. Who broke off your affair, you or Ted Maine? I did. It was at about that time that you applied for a job with another television company. That's right. Isn't it true that you didn't get that job because Ted Maine made a phone call to one of the company's executives? That was a rumor. I didn't pay much attention to it. What if I produce several co-workers who will testify that you were furious at the time, that you threatened Maine? <laughs> well, that was a long, long time ago. Where were you between 8 and 9 o'clock the evening of the 19th, Miss Kingsley? I was in a costume warehouse. With whom? I was alone. No more questions. No questions. Defense calls Nora Turner to the stand. I understand that before this book was published, you planned to run for your late husband's seat in Congress. That's right. You still plan to run? Not now. Where were you the night Ted Main was murdered? I was home with my daughter. The two of you were at home that night? Yes. Who's Gary Hazelton? He's my boyfriend. We're going steady. Isn't it true that on the night Ted Maine was murdered, you were with Gary? Objection. Leading. Overruled. Mr. Mason. Isn't it true that on the night Ted Maine was murdered, you were with Gary? I was at home with my mother. Mr. Hazelton, would you please stand? Sandra, unless you tell me the truth, I'll have to put your friend on the stand. If he lies for you under oath, he'll go to jail. Is that what you want? No. I wasn't home that night. I was out with Gary. Thank you, Mr. Hazelton. The day I came to your house, something was burning in the fireplace, a red dress. 
You were trying to destroy it, were you not? Yes. Was that because you suspected your mother was the one who killed Ted Maine? Speak up, Sandra. Yes. I have no more questions. No questions, Your Honor. Witness is excused. And I think we'll break here for lunch. Court is in recess until 2.30. As long as you don't touch anything. Well, it looks like Nora Turner did it, huh? She certainly could have. What are you doing here? There are still a couple of missing pieces. So what are your chances of proving Roxanne Shields innocent? Charlie. Do something for me, will you? Go over there and open that chest. I I'm sorry, what chest? That chest. And bring me the camera you put in it. Ted Maine would be proud. I'm an investigative reporter. That so? I just want the real story, Mr. Mason. At what cost to yourself? What, what is that supposed to mean? You're not above using rumor or innuendo, are you? I do what I have to do to get the truth. Charlie, what you have to do is to make sure it's possible to tell the difference between you and Ted Maine. And you can't? If I were running your network, I'd give you Ted Maine's show. You'd be a perfect replacement. Can I quote you on that? Definitely. What was that all about? Just exchanging points of view. She could use a new one. She's a good reporter, Ken. She's a bright and talented young woman. I like her. You could have fooled me. And that's not so easy. Those are the police photos? Yeah. Okay. Ted Maine comes home. He takes a shower. He pours himself a drink. And that's when the killer comes. Now, since there's no sign of forced entry, he probably let the killer in himself. And since a glass of brandy with his fingerprints all over it was sitting out on the bar, the glass of scotch that was found on the floor must have been meant for his killer. So he pours him or her a drink, turns around and gets stabbed in the chest. He drops the glass, falls to the floor, and dies. How'd whatever was sitting there, how did it get broken? It's a bull. Maybe he staggered into it and knocked it over. No, he would have left a trail of blood both ways. Why should that have been broken? Doesn't make sense. How did the killer know Roxanne would be wearing a red dress that night? That doesn't make sense either. Maybe her assistant told someone. No, no reason to. Look, you take the red dress, I'll take the bull. Surprise. Look, Mason just raked me over the coals. I really, I don't need it from you two. Well, I got news for you. Mason actually likes you. <laughs> got a pretty funny way of showing it. 
part of his charm, I guess. Now I gotta go. Wait. I've been thinking. Um, I want to help. I bet. Now just listen a second, okay? I, I realize that I've been fairly obnoxious. And, um, I feel really bad about what happened the other day. Is that enough of an apology for you? Ken, please don't make this any tougher for me than it already is. Get in. stop you. Are we going somewhere specifically or are we just out for a drive? Okay, here's the plan. The killer had to know that Roxanne was going to wear a red dress the night of the murder. Oh, yeah, so I heard about Mason's little trick in the courtroom, all those mysterious ladies in red. Very smart. Wish we had been there. Sorry. As I was saying, I was on my way to Roxanne's suite at the Hotel St. Clair. So you're going to figure out how the killer knew about that dress? I want to try. Ken? Yes? I think you're going about this entirely the wrong way. What are you talking about? The Hotel Sinclair. It's back that way. You should have turned left about six blocks ago. I knew that. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Thank you, Miss Street, for agreeing to testify. Proceed, Mr. Mason. Miss Street, this is the murder weapon. Now, I recently asked you to buy a knife identical to the one in this photo, did I not? It's similar to the murder weapon. Yes, you did. And were you able to do that? Yes, I was. With what degree of success? Bailiff. I found a dozen similar knives. Your Honor... At this time, I'd like to request that those knives be entered into evidence as defense exhibits 15, 16, 17, 18, through 26. I object! Your Honor, anyone could have gone out and bought a knife just like the ones on that table and the one in that photograph and used it to kill Ted Main and then planted it in Roxanne's car. Objection! Now Mr. Mason is testifying. Thank you, Miss Street, that's all. No questions. Are you trying to say that I helped somebody frame Roxanne? No. No. Not at all. Maybe you told somebody about the dress inadvertently? The only person I talked to about that dress was Roxanne. Was the dress in this room the whole time? Yes. You didn't need to press it or anything? Of course. But it only took a couple of minutes. Can you show us where you pressed it? This is where I did it. Um, I have much better things to do with my time, thanks. Roxanne, how do you feel about Ted Maine? What? The next time I see him, I'm gonna lay up this for his rotten little heart! Did you mean it when you said that, Ms. Shields? Of course not. Then why did you say it? Because I was hurt. And I was humiliated, and I was mad, but... I never would have really killed him. We've heard Mr. Wyman swear under oath that the woman who went up to Ted Main's apartment the night he was murdered was wearing Roxanne perfume. Now, it's called Roxanne because you endorse it. Is that correct? Yes. Is this the perfume you endorse? It's the Roxanne bottle. Yes, this is Roxanne. Would you put some on your left wrist, please? One would assume that because you endorse Roxanne perfume, you also wear it. One would assume that, yes. In point of fact, 
You do not wear it, do you? No. You do not wear any perfume, do you? No. Isn't it true that you are so allergic to the ingredients commonly found in perfume that you take antihistamines just to be in the same room with women who do wear perfume? Yes, that is very true. If you try wearing even a little perfume, what happens? This happens. Is this what you were looking for? Depends on the view. You've seen four rooms already. The view is basically the same. Well, some are better than others. Malansky? Looks like this is the one. Looks like you're right. Good news. At Roxanne's hotel, there's a room in an adjacent wing that looks directly into Annie Bullen's office. And that's how the killer knew what Roxanne was wearing the night of the murder. See, she rented the room and she watched Annie press the dress. Actually, we figured that much out thanks to Charlie. Who rented the room? Well, we know that it was a woman. She stayed one night and she paid cash. She registered under the name of Jane Johnson. They only remember that she wore a scarf and sunglasses. But when we talked to the maid who cleaned the room after she checked out, she said she remembered one thing vividly. Whoever stayed in that room was a smoker. The maid said the wastebasket was full of cigarette butts. She remembered it vividly because that room's on a non-smoking floor. Dellum, find out the date of Ted Maine's birthday. Mm -hmm. Ken, talk to the maid. Find out what brand that woman smoked. Right away. Barry, tomorrow's Della's birthday, you know. Shh. I'm trying to keep it a secret. What'd you get her? Remember, I'm also keeping that a secret. I could have gone to my network with all of this, you know. Yes, I know. You're not surprised that I didn't? No. I am pleased. Barry. Ted Maine were engaged to be married. Is that right, Ms. Rand? Yes, it is. How long had you known him? Mm, we met about a year ago when Rand Cosmetics became the sole sponsor of his show. You became engaged when? Within a month. We fell in love almost instantly. And after he published this book in which he described his affairs with various women in extensive detail, how did you feel about him then? I still loved him. All those affairs happened long before he met me. You didn't feel angry or resentful? Of course not. It was ancient history. Isn't it also ancient history that you suffer from a psychotic kind of jealousy? Objection. Relevancy. Sustained. Your birthday's when, Ms. Rand? August 7th. Ted Maine's birthday? April 24th. So, according to astrology, he was a, um, a... A Taurus. Taurus. Taurus the bull. You believe in astrology, don't you, Ms. Rand? It's harmless fun. Last year for his birthday, didn't you give Ted a present? A ceramic bull identical to this one? Yes, I gave Ted a statue like that, yes. Where were you the night your fiancé was murdered, Ms. Rand? I was home. Alone. Your Honor, I have no more questions of this witness. But I reserve the right to recall her at a later time. Mr. Kelly, what time did you go on duty as night manager at the Hotel Sinclair on March 19th? 3 p.m. sharp. I'm never late. Never. Is it true that room 1502 in the east wing of the Hotel Sinclair has a view towards the south wing where your luxury suites are located? Yes, sir, that is correct. Do you recall who checked into that room on March 19th? Yes, sir. She called herself Jane Johnson. You say called herself. 
You had reason to doubt her name? Well, she insisted on paying cash. She refused to show any identification or credit cards. She wore dark sunglasses and a high scarf. Well, you know, like a celebrity or something. Can you describe her in any other way? Yes. She was about five foot six inches tall, dark hair, excellent figure, marvelous perfume. Would you say she was about the same size as Laura Rand? That's the woman sitting just in back of the prosecutor. Yes. But you can't positively identify her. No, sir. No. Mr. Hartman, you have in your hand Defense Exhibit 15, a knife like the one used to kill Ted Main. Is it true that you sell those at your hunting shop? Yes, sir, definitely. Do you recall selling a knife like that to a woman on the 19th of March? Yes, uh, definitely the afternoon of the 19th I did. What makes you so sure? Well, Mr. Mason, I sell a lot of handguns to women, but a knife like this, I hardly ever sell one of these to a woman. So I remember it clearly. Can you describe the woman? <laughs> She's built uh, real nice. Uh, she had a, a sexy perfume, you know, the kind that drive most guys a little crazy. Um, but like I told you before, she had dark shades and a scarf on, so I really didn't see her face too clearly. Your Honor, I recall Laura Rand. Ms. Rand, you were a guest at the Hotel Sinclair the night of the murder? No. Have you ever visited the Hotel Sinclair? No, never. Have you ever visited Mr. Hartman's hunting supply store? No, never. Your Honor, I fail to see the point of any of this line of questioning. This is all baseless, and Mr. Mason is wasting the court's time. Your Honor, once again, I reserve the right to recall Ms. Rand and now call Police Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock, you are and have been stipulated to be a recognized expert in criminalistics, are you not? That is correct. Did you recently have the opportunity to examine the desk register and room 1502 at the Hotel Sinclair? Yes, at your request, I examined both of those areas for fingerprints. Did you also check and examine the front counter area of Hartman's hunting supply store for fingerprints? Yes, I did, Mr. Mason. Were you able to locate and identify any legible prints? As you can imagine, there were quite a few full and partial prints which were discovered. Of these, we took only the clear, full prints and matched them with our known exemplars. Were you able to identify those prints, Lieutenant? The matched prints belong to Laura Rand. Now I ask you, on the night of March 19th, did you not go to your fiancé's penthouse and murder him, knowing Roxanne Shields would be blamed? No. I loved Ted. Why would I kill him? Mr. Melansky, according to the sworn testimony Marie Danton gave in this courtroom, she had an affair with Ted Maine, not in June of 1990, as he contended in his book, but in June of 1991, while he was engaged to you, he lied to you, didn't he? You became jealous, insanely jealous. How many other women had he lied about? How many? A statue identical to the one you'd given Ted Main was found 10 feet from his body, broken into hundreds of pieces. Now, how did that happen, Ms. Rand? I don't know. I wasn't there. We show you a blow-up from page 94 of Maine's book. It's a picture of Ted and Marie Danton. Now, if you look closely, you can see the statue you gave him in the background. It's not in any other picture, just that one. You certainly realized the significance of that, did you not? Ted Maine had had an affair after he met you? Maybe several? That made you insanely jealous, did it not? Roxanne Shields' statement on television gave you the perfect person to frame. You were insanely jealous of her, too, were you not? So, 
He went to his penthouse that night, disguised as Roxanne Shields. You stabbed him to death. And you smashed the statue. The present you'd given him. You smashed it to bits. <laughs> Ironic. Isn't it, Ms. Rand? The loving present you'd given him is one of the things that trapped you. Mr. Mason. Do you want to know what is really ironic? Ted's ego. If he hadn't included Marie Datton in that book, <laughs> I never would have known. Oh, but he just had to include her pictures in all. <laughs> he just couldn't resist flaunting one last conquest. <laughs> Think men get what they deserve. Don't you? Move to dismiss, Your Honor. Defense certainly concurs. Motion is granted. Bailiff is instructed to take this witness into custody. This court is adjourned. I think so. Harry? So, I... what about that charity dinner? You just named the day, and I am there. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Della. Oh, oh. good luck, dear. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Oh. Hold on, hold on. Where, where, where are you going? That is one murderer I happen to be on a first name basis with any luck, and I'm going to get an exclusive. Well, I thought maybe we could have lunch. Are you kidding? Dinner. Meet me at the station at 6.30. I'm not waiting till 6.30. What's this? Present. For whom? For you. Put it away. <laughs> oh. Oh, they're, they're gorgeous. Next fall, we'll take a trip to where those grew up. Who's the greatest detective in the world? Sherlock Holmes. Happy birthday. video from her album called Caitlin. We're at the home of Max Parrish, Caitlin's father and manager, where today Caitlin Parrish is marrying actor Gary Hawk. Like us, Caitlin's fans are here hoping to get a glimpse of the happy couple, but so far we're all out of luck. I'm Ann Liebman, Entertainment Today, outside the Parrish Mansion. Go away. Maybe 
think Gary was right. We should come on. <laughs> they would have found you wherever you went. You're a star. At least this way, you have your family, your friends. You know, you and Dad are the only ones I care about. You and Uncle Perry. Are you sure he's coming? Well, he said he would, and Perry Mason always keeps his word. <laughs> Whoops, it's uh, almost four o'clock. I'll tell your father you're ready. Okay. Oh, honey, I'm so happy for you. Thank you, Mom. Let the others keep an eye on the ground. I want at least one of you two in here on duty at all times. We'll take care of it, sir. Any of those gifts get stolen, it's your personal responsibility. You got it, Mr. Parrish. This is my daughter's special day. I don't want anything to spoil it. We'll take care of it, sir. What's your problem? I busted a gut to land this job. I'm not losing it. I put it away. Lighten up. Look, you don't know me, so I'm telling you. I won't ask you again. Put it away. Got a real attitude, you know that, pal? I ain't your pal. No kidding. Harry. Oh, hello, Max. It's great to see you. You remember Della? Of course. Glad you could come. Me too. Glad to meet you. I love weddings. Usually so do I. My wife calls me a hopeless romantic. Uh, it's been too long, Perry. Where are the women in your life? <laughs> They're both upstairs. I haven't seen either one since early this morning. Here's the bridegroom, Gary Hawks. Ah, handsome young man. Oh, he's a star on a daytime soap. Uh, one life for tomorrow. I happened to see it once. You saw it twice. I saw it once. He's very good. Who'd have ever thought I'd be father-in-law to Brad Hawks' boy? It's a strange world, Perry. Well, duty calls. Didn't you tell me that Gary's father was Max's partner? Yeah, in a talent agency. When it broke up, they never spoke to each other again. Brad died a few years ago in a car accident with his wife. Huh. Whoa, 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 whoa. What, are you nervous? Huh? Yeah. Well, maybe I should marry Kay. Make sense? What are you talking about? You know, I work for her dad. Marrying the boss's daughter is a very good career move, so if you're really nervous, then we'll switch. I'll be the groom. You'll be the best man. You're a pal, Sam, but I gotta go. Mr. Hawks, 
This is Della Street. I'm Perry Mason. Oh, it's a pleasure. Indeed. He always says you're a favorite uncle. I'm her only uncle. Right. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mason, I'm Hannah Hawk, scary sister. Ah, the maid of honor. Yes. I just wanted to tell you that I've studied all your cases, and I hope I'm half as good as you are someday. Are you a lawyer? Knock on wood. Well, up until a few years ago, I thought I was a singer, but I switched tracks. I'm taking the bar next week. Good luck to you. Thank you. Maybe we can talk later? Of course we can. Okay, thanks. Perry, I'm so glad you could make it. Laura, you look wonderful. Oh. And you have not changed a bit. You remember what I used to say. You never change, Perry Mason. You only weather. And Della, of course. I've heard so much about you. This must be quite a day for you. Thank you for inviting me, Mrs. Parrish. Laura, please. Perry, thank you. Thank you for coming. You have no idea how much this means to me. Hey, they're waiting. Just coming. Max Parrish. I told you everything I know. What more do you want? No, you can't come out. Not today. Because I'm telling you, not today. Commission again? Can you believe that they would call here today? Dad, can't your lawyers do something? Now they're intimating that someone may have some new evidence. Don't worry, I'll handle it. Let me look at you. Maybe you should talk to Uncle Perry. Sweetheart, this is your wedding day. And nothing is going to spoil it. That's a promise. same civil rights committee. What civil rights committee? Oh, around 25 years ago. The year you lectured at Georgetown? That year, yes. Laura and I spent a lot of time together. Laura and Max were going through a very bad time. They filed for divorce. How'd they get back together? Oh, they hit a very rough patch, but they weathered it. Laura had found out she was pregnant. Now, they're the happiest couple I know. Especially today. Especially today. please. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the face of God and in the face of this company to join together this man and woman in holy matrimony, that which is honorable among all men, 
and therefore is not by any to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently. I can't believe I'm missing this. If any person here can show this cause why these people should not be joined together, let them speak so, now or forever. Get out of my way. Get away from me. Hey, I thought you'd get away with this, didn't you? Hello, Lon. Why don't you sit down? Don't invite me to my own nephew's wedding. My own brother's son. It's a matter, Max, you forget? No, I didn't forget, Lon. Your new father-in-law thinks he's too good for me. Lon, God's sake. It's Kay's wedding day. Well, you're not better than me. And this will show you. I'm getting security. This will show you just what kind of man you really are. I'm lying. Sorry, everybody. Uh, if you'll just give us a moment, everything will be just fine. Take him into the study. Please just give us a moment. I'm so sorry, baby. Your Uncle Lon, isn't he ever going to leave us alone? I mean, last time we gave him money, he swore he'd never come back. I could kill him. You want us to call the cops, Mr. Parrish? No cops, no reporters. Put him in my study. Here, I'll get that door for you. Oh. It's a waste of time. Ah. Guess he can't bother anybody in here. This door lead to the dining room? Yeah, I liked it from the other side, remember? Keep him in here. What's that? Nothing. Give it to me. Sleep it off, buddy boy. Care of everything. But it's your wedding day. This is terrible. Mom, it's all right. I promise. I mean, if this hits the news, I'll sell another three million CDs. Easy. The staff says they'll have everything cleared up in 20 to 30 minutes. Oh, thanks, Perry. I'd better make an announcement. Um, Mom, Gary, take my mom and get some champagne. Sure. They have the envelope I won't let it. anyone or anything spoil your wedding day. Remember, that's a prance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good friends, uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. We'll be ready to continue in just a little while. So just have some champagne and thank you for your patience. gift for each of the guests you know maybe if we handed them out now we could fill some time good idea sam and that's my job sir i'm the best man uh they're in the dining room and sam thanks max has a fine collection of western art oh, it's beautiful mm -hmm.
Sam? Hmm? Where are they? The keepsake gifts. Oh, I'm sorry, Max. I couldn't find them. Well, they're on the side table in the dining room. I'll go. No, no. I'll have them. Thank you. I was, uh, just... I forgot to sign the card on my present. Are you all right, Hannah? Oh, I'm fine. Really. Max, Gary, Reverend Roper is ready to try again if we are. Great, great. Sam, Sam, tell me, you seen Kay? Well, you didn't lose her, did you? She wanted to have it out with your Uncle Lon. I asked you five minutes to You're watch You're the crew, I'm the crew, you let her go? I thought Damn. I had talked to her out of it. My daughter in there. Couldn't stop her, Mr. Powers. Try. Just like Mr. Parrish told us. Okay, and no one went in or out, you're saying, except Miss Parrish. Like, right? like we said, nobody. Lieutenant, Good. commission yes. staff, I'll have to call you back on this. Good. Stop. So, um... What's going to happen, Perry? That depends on Lieutenant Brock. Miss Parrish, would you have a look at this, please? It's blank. That's right. But you took it with your left hand. You are left-handed, are you not, Miss Parrish? Yes, so what? So that means I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of Alonzo Hawk, Sergeant, would you read her rights? Wait, wait, wait. Just, right just tell them, Kate. Gary, Caitlin, tell them that under advice of counsel, you've been instructed not to answer any questions. Judging by the entry angle of the knife wound, the killer had to be left-handed. Doctor, you're certain the autopsy will confirm that? No question. Well, thank you, Doctor. Mr. Mason, you saw for yourself your client is a left-handed artist. That's all you've got? Well, let's see what I got. I got a room here, sir, with bars on the window. I got a victim left in here, unconscious, but alive. I got two doors, one locked, the other under constant surveillance by the security men outside. And I have a suspect, sir, Caitlin Parrish, who made threatening remarks against the victim and was then found standing over the body of the victim, one lawn horse. And that's what I've got, Mr. Mason. That... The key was in the lock on this side. Anyone could have entered the study from this room. I personally saw several people come in and out before Hawks was found dead. Yes, Mr. Mason, but your client was the only one found standing over the dead person with the murder weapon at her feet and blood on her hands. Now, why would she kill him? What possible motive could she have had? Now, Mr. Mason, I'm working on that, sir. I'm working on that. Now, would you like to talk to your client before I take it downtown, sir? Thank you. Caitlin, Hawks was a violent man. If somehow you caused his death... I didn't do it, Perry. I didn't do it. The blood on your hands. He was lying on the sofa. 
I thought he was asleep. So I tried to wake him, and then I saw the knife. He was dead. Why did you want to wake him? Why did you go in there in the first place? I was mad. He attacked Dad. He ruined our wedding day. I, I don't know what I wanted to do. Just tell him off, I guess. I didn't kill him. You have to believe me. Okay, then I believe you. But there are others we'll have to convince. What a terrible thing. I feel so sorry for her mother. First call, Ken. If he's still fishing, get him back. Then we have to arrange bail. Who did that? Somebody knocked my coat on the floor. And I had Caitlin's wedding invitation in the pocket. So you lost it. But it's a collector's item, Eddie, especially now. What's that? Looks like a backstage concert pass. The girl who owns this pass was hiding in that closet. She would have had a clear view of this whole front hall. She probably saw something. More than probably. I'll call Ken. Thank you for that report, Louise. Elsewhere in the news, a major traffic accident on the Interstate 80 north of Denver had traffic My pass. Three hours today. This isn't a real pass. It's a giveaway. A what? Rock clubs hand these out by the hundreds as promotions. Kids put their photos in them and use them like they're the real thing, but they're not. So there's no way to trace the girl in that photo? I wouldn't say that. We know she's a fan of Caitlin's. We also know she's five foot two, 16 years old, with short brown hair. The girl, Della, the girl that ran away from us at the wedding. Oh, yes. Brown eyes. Well, I'll take this to the club that gave it out. If this girl's a regular there, somebody might recognize her picture. Ken, I had the security men make a list of everyone who entered the dining room while Hawks was in the study. I'd like them checked out. Sam Wall, Hannah Hawks, Max Parrish. Everyone, including the two security men. Ken, you take Hannah, I'll take Max. Right. Oh, but first you have to... But first, I have to get Caitlin released on bail, I know.
My name's Malansky, Ken Malansky. I work with Perry Mason. You might have heard of him. Is this your handout? Uh huh. Great. You ever seen this girl in your club? Mm -hmm. You like body art, Ken? Body art? Tattoos? Got any? You know, somehow I never found the time. It's a shame you have the skin for it. It's a shame to waste it. Yeah, well, thanks. Look, could you give me a call on my mobile phone? Anytime. I mean, if you see this girl. Mm. Think about a dragon right there. I will. I'd love to work on you. I'll think about it. Call me if you see the girl, okay? Did you know your father was under investigation? By the State Artist Commission? Of course I knew. It's been going on for weeks. It's old news. Not to me. My father's a talent manager. He manages me, he manages Gary, he manages 15 or 20 other top actors and singers. Look, you manage that many people who make that much money. You're a magnet for lawsuits. It's part of the business, Mr. Mason. My father has always been completely honest and fair. He's never been accused of anything illegal. Until now. The commission thinks Max embezzled a quarter of a million dollars in client funds. That's a lie. Lie or not, why wasn't I told about it? This has got nothing to do with Gary's Uncle Lon. Lieutenant Brock thinks it does. So does the DA. They think it's an absolute motive for murder. Now... Is there anything else I should know? No. Caitlin, it's been a long time since you've been told what to do. But from here on in, I'm going to tell you what to do. He's the man, Kate. Understood? All right. All right. She needs you, Mr. Mason. She knows it, and it scares her. Please, you gotta help her. Yes, I do. I know we should have told you about the commission investigation, Perry, but Kay insisted that we keep it quiet. Why? If something like this went public, I could lose my business. Max, the prosecution's going to bring it out at the hearing. Tell me about the investigation. $250,000 is missing from our client accounts. The commission claims I embezzled it. Any idea who took the money? Could have been anyone in the firm. I'm ready to make restitution, but the commission wants to investigate. That a problem? The records are gone. Wiped out by computer error. Whoever took the money must have done it. 
I have no way of finding out who. Were you subpoenaed? Eight days ago. Let me see the subpoena. It's at home. In your study. Where Lieutenant Brock found it the day of the murder. Damn. That's what he meant when he told me he was working on a motive. How could the commission's investigation have anything to do with the motive for Lon's murder? We were there. We all saw it. Lon Hawks brandishing an envelope and saying, this will show everybody what kind of a man you really are. He was drunk. Who knows what he meant? Max, that envelope wasn't found on Hawks' body. What are you saying? I'm saying the prosecution is going to suggest that envelope contained documents incriminating to you. They're going to suggest Caitlin killed Hawks and hid the envelope to protect you. That's ridiculous. She had the murder weapon. She was alone in the room with the body. Is that ridiculous? Who else has access to your computer? <sighs> Anyone using the main terminal has to go through me and log. Let's take a breather, okay? All right, class, take five. Miss Hawks, I'm impressed. I like to stay in shape, Mr. Uh... Malansky, Ken Malansky. I work with Perry Mason. He's representing Caitlin Parrish. Ah, oh, yes, I know. Your tutor tells me you're a star pupil, even though you only took up karate three years ago. Mr. Poe is very kind. Three years ago? That was right around the time you moved to Seattle, wasn't it? What prompted the move? A job? Boyfriend? Mr. Melansky, are you interrogating me? Ken. <laughs> well, I suppose I am. Well, my singing career was over. And I didn't know what to do. So I guess I just wanted to find myself. Don't you mean lose yourself? You didn't talk to your whole family for nearly three years. But then you came back here early this year. When was that? March? April? March. That was right after your Uncle Lon was jailed for assault. <sighs> There's no connection. I didn't say that there was. You must have been very surprised when he showed up at the wedding. We all were. Lon was sentenced to 10 years. And released on appeal. You are very skilled with your hands, Miss Hawks. Both of them. Good luck with the bar. Thanks. Were all your records wiped out? No, just the records for the first quarter of this year. That's when they say I embezzled the funds. A selective erasure. The commission thinks it was very convenient. And uh, I can't prove otherwise. Excuse me, Max. Mr. Mason, I hear you're defending Kay. That's good news. Thank you, Mr. Wall. You're Gary's best man. I am. Sam's one of my top people. I'm lucky to have him, especially now. Max, the bank sent an update covering last month's transactions. Do you want me to enter it? Sure. Go ahead. Keep me posted about the commission's investigation. The security men, Frank Bassett, Dave Tynan, Sam Wall, Max Parrish, and Hannah Hawks. That's everything I could get on them so far. Thank you. Here's what I have to add on Hannah Hawks. She's lethal with both hands. I saw her in action. Thanks to both of you. I've talked to Caitlin and Max Parrish. That leaves the security men, Sam Wald, and... The girl in this picture. It's a copy of the photo that was in the pass. I talked to the owner of the club where we think she hangs out. If she shows up there tonight, they'll give us a call. I guess all we can do is wait. We'll do the waiting. You'll have to find out what Lon Hawks had in that envelope. And how will I do that? 
Della, Gary Hawks? He's here. Well, send him in. He'll get you access to Hawks' apartment. Malansky, right? Right. Good. Okay. I spoke to the super. He said we'd go pick up the key anytime after six. So we can leave whenever you're ready. Actually, I think it's better if I go by myself. Yeah, why is that? It's the way I work. Well, that's fine. But it's my fiance who's framed for murder, and I want to participate. I mean, I don't want to just sit around here and do nothing. Hey, look, I never sit around and do nothing. I am I'm sure Gary wants to be of assistance. All right, I'll meet you at Lon Hawk's apartment at 7 o'clock, okay? Okay, I'm on the case. Perry, I don't want this guy underfoot. Ken, he may be helpful. Helpful? But Perry, he's an actor. <laughs> hey, before you go to Hawk's place, I'd like you to talk with Sam Wald. He should be at this address now. All right. You know, Perry, for a second I thought somebody was tailing me this afternoon. If you were followed, it might mean this youngster is doubly important to us. Also, it might mean we should find her before the killer does. Okay. Mr. Wald? My name's Melansky. I'm an associate of Perry Mason. I'd like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, I was wondering when you'd get around to me. You guys want to talk to everyone who was in the dining room before Lon Hawks was killed, right? That's right. A car like this must be pretty expensive, huh? My only vice. You don't count women, but then uh, who does? <laughs> and at my salary, I can afford them both. How'd you hurt your hand? Oh, I uh, burnt it on the engine. Hurt like hell, I can tell you. Then you still drive? I manage. By compensating with your left hand? <laughs> um, Melansky? I was in the dining room. I didn't find what I was looking for, and I left. Guards in the hall saw me. End of story. Now, if you don't mind, I'd really like to make a few more adjustments here. If Lon Hawks had information that Max Parrish was embezzling funds from his clients, Max would be forced out of his own firm, and you'd take over, wouldn't you? I resent these insinuations. They're not insinuations, they're speculations based on fact. And I didn't hear you deny them. We'll be in touch. Think you better wait here. What are you talking about? As an attorney, you have a right to be here. You don't. Wait, wait. You know, that's what I hate about being on a soap opera. You know, nobody takes you seriously. Now, if I was Al Pacino, you wouldn't have said a word. You know, you may be right. Wait here. About time you showed up. Your dinner's run, and I hope you're happy.
Kenneth Rocky. That girl you're looking for, she's here. The mobile customer you are trying to reach is away from the car or out of our service area. Going anywhere till Mr. Vance gets here. Vance? Word of advice. Don't waste Mr. Vance's time. Just tell him what you did with the goods. What goods? He's gonna play cute. Mr. Vance will love that. Yeah, he's got a great sense of humor. When do I get to meet him? In the morning. <sighs> Mr. Halford. What can you tell me about Dave Tynan? Well, for one thing, Dave Tynan's been with us only a few weeks. He worked crowd control, concerts, security for clubs, bodyguards for visiting celebs. Frank Bossett was armored car support. But Bossett worked on the parish wedding. It was a sizable job. We had to bring in almost our whole staff. I'd like to talk to Tynan and Bossett. Tynan's ship starts in about 10 minutes. You should find him in the locker room. And, uh, Bossett. You'll have to reach him at home. I let him go yesterday. Oh? The man showed up drunk for work. I had no choice. Thank you, Mr. Halford. <laughs> Mr. Tynan? Yeah. My name's Mason. I'm representing Caitlin Parrish. Yeah, sure. I remember you. And I remember you, Mr. Tynan. You knocked Lon Hawks cold with one punch. Yeah, I'm pretty good with my hands. Good enough to earn yourself two years at Centennial Correctional Facility for assault. <laughs> Afraid you got me mixed up with somebody else. One set of fingerprints from Parrish's study led us to your rap sheet, Mr. Tynan. Now, how well did you know Lon Hawks? I never saw him before. But he served time at Centennial, same time you did. So, Hawks recognized you. That's why you hit him so hard and so fast. Why would I care? You lied to get this job. Hawks could have exposed you. All right, listen. Yeah, sure, I hit Lon. Shut him up. It doesn't mean I killed him. I'm not even left-handed. But you have a very good motive. So when was I supposed to kill him? Frank was there the whole time. Look, Mr. Mason, I need this job. Don't blow it for me. So you didn't kill Lon Hawks? No, sir. I swear to it. That's all, then. I haven't heard from Ken yet. Do you want some more? Uh, no more, thank you. You're really worried, aren't you? Yes, I am. The pieces just don't fit. I just saw my father. What do you think you're doing? Trying to prepare your defense for tomorrow's preliminary hearing? You're trying to make him a suspect because of some stupid embezzlement charge. Everyone who was in that dining room is suspect. Sam Wald, Anna Hawks, even your father. 
I won't let you drag him into court. You ruin him. I know how you feel. No, you don't. I love my father. I'd do anything to protect him. Young lady, that's exactly what the prosecution wants the court to believe. They'll try to have the embezzlement charge admitted into evidence to provide you with a motive for murder. Then don't let him do it. Caitlin. Caitlin. Are you afraid your father might be guilty of this murder? No, no, he, he can't be. I know he can't be. I'm sorry, Perry. I just don't want to see him get hurt. Neither do I. I believe he's innocent. I will do whatever I can to protect him and his reputation. All right. All right. She's tough, isn't she? She might just say the same about you. She doesn't know me. So she doesn't know how far I'd go to protect her and her family. thousand of those shipped in from Taiwan. At five bucks a pop bootleg, that's what? 250 grand. Somebody ripped off my warehouse for half of them. And there's people that tell me that somebody was you, Hawks. Hawks? Tony, hurt this boy some more. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You think I'm Lon Hawks? No, I think you're Michael Jackson. Lon Hawks is dead. My name's Melansky. Here, look at my ID. Hawks is dead? Don't you people read the newspaper? I've been out of town. You brought me a lawyer? A lawyer? Why didn't you say something before? Because I wanted to meet the head man, you. Look, I work for Perry Mason. We're trying to figure out who killed Hawks. Maybe you can help us out. Now, you say he stole some of your cassettes? Mr. Malansky, there's been a mistake. A very, very bad mistake. Thinking you were Hawks. Hey, it's okay, really. I think... Maybe we've told you too much already. You take care of this. Yeah. So listen, Tony, man. This was your deal, you understand? You take care of it. Here. Sure you're up to murder? Just so the man doesn't lose his money? You sure you want to do this? Yeah. What a bunch of dismal two-bit punks, huh? If Vance wants you to take care of this guy, why don't you use your heads? What, you gonna whack this creep right where the man keeps his goods? What's the matter with you bozos? Who are you? Hey, you are so dumb, you don't even know who I am. Tell him who I am. One life for tomorrow. What? You ever see it? Hey, right there. No, not the fist, not the f Back off. Yeah, that's better. Now get on the floor. On the floor! Take a nap. Where are the cops? What cops? You didn't call the cops? I follow these guys. Wait outside all night in the freezing cold, bust in here and save your life, and you got nothing but criticism. Gary... I'm grateful, believe me. Now, will you please call the cops? That's all you're going to say? Oh, you were terrific. Pacino wouldn't have been able to cut this. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. Call him. Okay, okay, I'm calling. Call him. What were the findings of the autopsy you performed on the deceased, Dr. Stone? 
Recent contusions to the face and throat and a single penetration wound in the mid-thoracic region, eight centimeters deep, resulting in deep laceration of the superior vena cava. In layman's terms, a stab wound to the heart. In your opinion, was this the cause of death? Absolutely. What other conclusions did you draw from the stab wound, doctor? After examining the angle of entry and considering the force required to penetrate the heart, I concluded that the wound most likely would have been inflicted by a left-handed individual. Left-handed? No further questions. Dr. Stone, tell us about the contusions you found on the victim's body. I found two, one on the jaw, another on the throat. And were these recent bruises inflicted, say, within an hour of death? I assume they were received during the fight at the wedding. But if the so-called fight at the wedding was, in fact, just a single punch to the jaw, wouldn't that change your opinion about the bruises? Yes, it would. Indeed, it would. Could we not then conclude that the second bruise on the victim's throat was the result of a later struggle, probably between the victim and his killer? We could make that assumption, yes. Dr. Stone, would you describe the bruise on the throat? It was about three inches long, a quarter inch wide. About this long and wide. In your experience, doctor, would such a bruise be consistent with a violent karate blow? Yes. Exactly where was the bruise located? Here, just to the right of the Adam's apple. Could the bruise have been caused by a karate blow? I suppose so, yes. Now, would such a blow have to be delivered by someone right-handed? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. So, was the killer left-handed or right-handed, Dr. Stone? Or, uh, don't you know? <clears throat> no further questions, Your Honor. You may step down. It's 12.45. This court is in recess until 3 o'clock. Ah, put the speakers right over here. Mr. Mason, right there, okay? Mr. Boston, if I've come at the wrong time. Hey, no problem. I've been promising myself a good stereo system for years. I love gizmos, and I'm a jazz freak. Ella, Basie, Charlie Parker. You'll have a lot of time to catch up on your listening now that you've left your job. Yeah, I, uh, was fired. That's my severance pay. Can I help you, Mr. Mason? Yes, you can help me. I'd like to confirm your relationship with Tynan, Dave Tynan. A relationship? I don't know the guy. I don't want to know the guy. He's a jerk. And that one time at the wedding, he's a big, red-headed jerk. Thank you. That's all I need to know. Where'd you get this? First tell me if that's what I think it is. It's a bootleg tape. It's the unused track of uh, Caitlin Parrish's debut album. Where, where'd, you, where'd you get it, man? Valuable? Uh, a bootleg tape. It's worth about 15 bucks on the street. Where did you get it? If I wanted to sell 25,000 copies of that cassette to Starfront Records, Mr. Lubin, who would I talk to? You? Ah, uh, look, I got nothing more to say. You got nothing more to say. Right now, while you're sitting there with nothing more to say, my fiance is fighting for her life. She'd go to prison for the rest of her life because you got nothing more to say. Well, I'll tell you something. I got plenty to say. And I'm going to tell it to the press. And when she finally walks out of that courtroom, because we're going to prove her innocence with or without you, people are going to wonder where you were when she needed you most. And you know what I'm going to tell them? You were right here and you had nothing more to say. Hey, Gary. Hey, Lena, listen, maybe I should... Uh... Mr. Lube, when somebody offered to sell you 25,000 copies of that bootleg cassette, and you bought them to protect your royalties, now who was it? I don't know. 
It was just a, just a voice on the phone. Copyright fraud and extortion. Now, that's FBI jurisdiction. Is that who helps you with the payoff? Yep. How'd it go down? We paid $100,000. The guy asked for a, a package of used bills, no consecutive numbers to be dropped from an overpass. And then once the money was collected, we got a call that told us where to find the tapes. Okay. Thanks for your time. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't go public with this. I mean, we only agreed to the payoff because uh, the FBI assured us that, uh, that they'd catch him as soon as he starts spending the money. If the man you paid off is who I think it is, you don't have to worry about him spending your money anytime soon. And who is it? See you later, Mr. Lubin. Oh, no, come on. Oh, man. <laughs> Could anyone have entered the study without your seeing them? No, sir. And did you see anyone enter the study before the murder? Yes, sir. And is that person in this courtroom? Yes. Would you point that person out? Her. Indicating the defendant. No further questions. Mr. Bossett, isn't it true that although the door to the dining room was locked, the key was in the lock on the dining room side of the door? Yes. So anyone entering the dining room would have had access to the study during the time of the murder? Yes. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Parrish, is it true that you are currently under investigation by the State Artists Commission? Yes, I am, but no formal... Confine charge. yourself to answering my questions, Mr. Parrish. Isn't it true that the Commission is investigating charges regarding embezzlement? Do I have to answer the question? Yes, it's true. Isn't it true that these allegations concern the embezzlement of over a quarter of a million dollars? Your Honor, we will stipulate to the fact that Mr. Parrish is under investigation. However, these allegations are nothing more than allegations. Certainly, Mr. Parrish is not on trial here. Your observation is duly noted, Mr. Mason. Please get to the point, Mr. Norell. Yes, Your Honor. To the best of your knowledge, was your daughter aware of these charges? Yes. And did she know about them on the day of the murder? Yes. Did you ever discuss them with her? My daughter and I are very close. I have no secrets from her. Did she express great concern for you? Yes, of course. On the day of your daughter's wedding, when Lawn Hawks interrupted the proceedings, what did he do? He barged in, was loud and insulting, demanding to know why he wasn't invited. Didn't he also display an envelope? Yes. Didn't he also hold up this envelope and say, this will show people what kind of a man you really are? Isn't that true, Mr. Parrish? Yes. And what was your daughter's reaction? Kay was upset. Upset? Witnesses have testified that your daughter said she could kill him. Kay Parrish knew the bind you were in. She suspected that the contents of Lonhawk's envelope could destroy you. Objection, Your Honor. The she people... loved you. Sustained. Objection, Would Your Honor. Would she kill to protect you, Mr. Sustained. Parrish? Sustained. Defense objection sustained, Mr. Norell. I have no further questions for this witness. No questions, Your Honor. Witnesses excused. I feel so sorry for you. Max, Caitlin is done. Thank you. Lieutenant Brock, did you examine the crime scene? Yes, I did, sir. I show you this knife and ask you to identify it. This is a handmade decorative knife crafted by a local western artist. It has a five inch blade and a carved elk horn handle. And is this the murder weapon, Lieutenant? Yes, it is, sir. It has my mark on it. Would you say a woman could effectively wield this knife? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Lieutenant, 
Did you have occasion to examine the deceased? Yes, I did, sir. Did you find an envelope on the deceased? No, I did not, sir. I have no further questions. No questions. Fans continue to gather outside the Superior Court building, awaiting the results of Caitlin Parrish's preliminary hearing for the murder of Alonzo Hawks. You gotta be there. Bonnie. Caitlin needs to know her fans are behind her. You think she killed him? Your Honor. Our next witness addresses the issue of premeditation. The people call Ms. Hannah Hawks. Your Honor, the people request permission to regard this witness as a hostile witness. Permission granted. Now, at the time when your Uncle Lond was knocked down at the wedding, uh, you were standing right beside your brother and his fiancée, the defendant, Caitlin Parrish, were you not? Your Honor, will the court direct the witness to answer the question? You are under oath, Ms. Hawks. Answer the question. Yes, that's where I was standing. And what did you hear Kay Parrish say regarding her feelings towards your uncle, Lon Hawks? She said I could kill him. Please speak up. She said I could kill him, but she didn't mean it. No further questions. People say and do things they don't mean and later on regret. Your witness, Counselor. You're right about people, Miss Hawks. Miss Hawks, may I call you Hannah? Yes, of course. Isn't it true that you once tried to kill Lon Hawks? No. Three years ago, you tried to stab your Uncle Lon with a kitchen knife. If your brother hadn't stopped you, you would have killed him. Gary still doesn't know why you did it, but I think I do. I don't know what you mean. You disappeared for almost three years. You never wrote to your family, never called, didn't in any way communicate. Hannah, why don't you at last tell all of us what really happened? Uncle Lon beat me so severely that I had to go to the hospital. Your uncle was a violent man, was he not? Uh, objection, Your Honor. The victim is not on trial here. Your Honor, I request the widest possible latitude in order to get at the truth. Answer the question. He, um... He fractured my jaw and dislocated my shoulder. He could be a very violent man, especially if he'd been drinking. You must have hated him, and you kept what happened a secret. Well, I never told Gary. I never told anyone. Why not? Because Uncle Lon frightened me. You have no idea what it feels like to be that afraid. So three years ago, you left home and stayed away till this last March, when Hawks was arrested and sentenced to prison for assault. I thought I was finally rid of him. Then you saw him at Gary's wedding. Did you still hate him? More than you can imagine. Enough to kill him? Yes, I wanted to. And I think I probably could have. But I didn't kill him. No further questions. Any redirect? Uh, no, Your Honor. In that case, this court is recessed for 30 minutes. Oh, I heard what happened. I'm so worried. It's nothing. All right, I have good news and I have bad news. There's no answer at that club. Either Rocky's not there or the phone's unplugged. So far, that club of hers has turned out to be a dead end. But I think I know what was in that envelope Lon Hawks was waving around. You can tell us. His wedding present. $100,000 extorted from Kay's record company. That's what Hawks planned to give Kay and Gary for a wedding present? 
Maybe he meant that his gift would show everybody that Lon Hawks was just as good as Max Parrish. That's quite a bit of money. So we have another motive for murder and another suspect. All right, you two. Now we have to find that girl before he does. Mr. Wald, you have limited access to the parish computer records, do you not? That's right. According to this log, you accessed the company computer on June the 23rd. That was strictly routine. But June the 23rd wasn't exactly a routine day. June the 23rd was the day that the parish financial records were subpoenaed by a state commission. Tell me... Tell me, how much do you earn as a talent manager, Mr. Walt? In a good year, um, $60,000. Oh. You have a private income? <laughs> I wish. You own a very expensive race car. Secondhand. You have an account at the Transworld Bank of Chicago. Yes. Would you explain how, with an annual income of $60,000, you made a deposit of $250,000 to your account on February 20th this year? I don't recall. Max Parrish has been accused of embezzling $250,000 in client funds during the first quarter of this year. Now, who really took that money, Mr. Walt? There's no way to know that. The... Uh... Computer records are gone. Oh, that's true. The computer records are gone. But not these records. According to your bank statement, you wrote a check on June the 23rd to one Mitchell Carter for $30,000. Mitchell Carter, a computer expert with experience in tapping into computers and making records disappear. I don't know any Mitchell Carter. According to... Uh, this document, you hired Mitchell Carter because you needed someone who could get to pertinent records and destroy evidence of your embezzlement of that $250,000. No, that's not true. Max. Don't go to Max. Read Mr. Carter's declaration. It's right there. A declaration which will be submitted to the commission and to this court. It tells how Mr. Carter gained access to the records for you and of your attempt to conceal your crime. Mr. Wald, when Lon Hawks turned up at the parish wedding waving that envelope, isn't it true you thought it held proof of your guilt? I had no idea what he had in mind. Didn't you kill Hawks to protect yourself? No. No, I, I didn't kill Hawks. I didn't kill him. Mr. Wald, you did not kill Lon Hawks? Talk to me! No. No further questions. Your Honor, the prosecution requests a recess. You may step down, Mr. Wald. The court is adjourned until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. something for me, Rocky? Yeah. That girl you're looking for is here. All right, keep her there. I'm on my way.
Polanski. I need to talk to you about what happened at Kate Parrish's wedding. And were you employed as a security guard at the parish wedding? Yes, sir. Along with Frank Bossett. That's right. Mr. Tynan, are you left-handed? No. Did you serve two years at Centennial Correctional Facility for assault? Yeah, yeah, I did time. And while you were there, did you box on the prison team? Sure. I understand you won all your bouts. That your biggest asset was the ability to knock a man out with either hand. Yeah. Yeah, I could fight. Uh, Lon Hawks was at Centennial with you, wasn't he? I don't know. Uh, he might have been. In fact, Hawks was in your cell block. When he recognized you at the parish wedding, you panicked and knocked him out, did you not? I knocked him out because he was making trouble. In order to hit Hawks on the right side of the jaw, you had to use your left hand, did you not? I don't remember. After knocking him out, didn't you stab him to death with that same left hand? Not me, Counselor. I was in the hallway the whole time. Frank Bossett was in the hallway with me the entire time. And if you don't believe me, ask him. That's right. Me and Tynan was out in the hole the whole time. Neither of you took a break. Was there the whole time. How well do you know Dave Tynan? Met him that one time. Haven't seen him since. Mr. Bossett, did you recently buy some expensive stereo equipment? Yeah, so? How did you pay, cash or credit? <laughs> what difference does it make? When I spoke to the company where you bought the equipment, you paid cash, did you not? Yeah, use my uh, savings. No further questions at this time, but I reserve the right to recall, Your Honor. Mr. Bossett, I don't want the defense to uh, confuse the issue. You and Dave Tynan were continuously on duty in the hall outside the study, is that correct? Yeah. And until the defendant entered the study, you saw no one else go in, right? That's right. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor? Your Honor, defense calls Miss Susie Richards to the stand. Susie Richards, have we met before? Well, we bumped into each other. And when we bumped into each other, did you drop your souvenir backstage pass? I, I must have. Yes, I did. Now, when you took the stand, I gave you Defense Exhibit G found by Della Street at the parish residence in the room where you bumped into us. Now, is that your souvenir backstage pass? Yes, sir. Tell us, Susie, how did you happen to attend the parish and Hawk's wedding? Well, I sort of snuck in. Where did you go when you snuck in? There was a, a closet in the hall. I hid in there. From your vantage point in this closet, could you see out into the hall? When I opened the door crack, I could, yes. Now, why would you do that? I kept saying to myself, I can't believe I'm missing this. I mean, Caitlin Parrish's wedding, and I'm trapped in a closet, you know. But um, I couldn't get out because those two security guys were standing there. 
But you did get out. Well, yeah, eventually. I don't know when, but it was right after somebody made an announcement. What kind of announcement? I think it was her father saying he was sorry everything was delayed. And then some music started, and that's when I got out. But weren't the two guards there to stop you? No, uh uh, they were gone. Did you see where they went? Hey, all I knew was that they were gone, and I got out of there. Your witness, counselor. Uh, no questions, Your Honor. Your Honor, defense recalls Frank Bossett. Okay, okay, so we were gone for a couple of minutes. It was hot, we were thirsty. During the time you were gone, the study was unguarded. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. I suppose, yeah, yeah. This folder. What do you think this folder holds, Mr. Boston? How would I know? Please tell us what you think. Well, what are you trying to get me to say? It's, 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 it's full of cocaine. I'm trying to get you to say what you feel. What does it feel like? It feels like... like money. It feels like money. You knew Lon Hawks. You knew the folder that he carried held money because you picked it up. You can't prove there was money in it. The envelope's gone. Whatever was in it, that's gone too. Mr. Bossett, Lon Hawks was carrying money that day, say $100,000 in cash. Objection. That is pure conjecture. Your Honor, I was about to prove it. You may continue, Mr. Mason. If a man stole that kind of money... You'd expect him to lay low for a while, wouldn't you? Not draw attention to himself? Yeah, I, I, I suppose, yeah. The man who stole that money was tempted to spend just a little of it, wasn't he? Spend it on a nice new stereo. Why don't you tell us about it, Mr. Bossett? Tell you what? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about how you and Dave Tynan... Two men who barely knew each other conspired to murder Lon Hawks. You can't prove it. You can't prove anything. Your Honor, referring to our conference this morning, we can proceed with the demonstration. Bailiff, will you proceed? Lon Hawks extorted $100,000 from Starfront Records. The FBI handled the payoff. Neither Hawks nor his killers knew that the FBI treated the payoff money with an invisible dye. Now, the lights, please, Your Honor. Bailiff, the lights. Anyone in recent contact with that treated money would show the dye in his hands in a so called black light. A black light like this one, Mr. Bossett. Now let's see your hands. You just had to spend a dinch of Come on! You killed him! You killed him! He killed him! Perry, you okay? You uh, knocked out my shoulder. See you back at the office. Take these men into custody and get the paramedics in here immediately. Stay down. Perry. Perry. No, Perry's okay. It's Are you a shoulder sure he's all right? We'll see you at the office. Red-eye. Bella, I'll be with you. You just couldn't wait, could you? Mr. Norell. Mr. Malansky. This case is dismissed and the court is adjourned. Della. Please tell Perry I owe him so much. He's given me back my daughter. Why don't you tell him yourself? I can't. There's so much you don't know about Perry and me. Oh, Laura. I know. I really know. <laughs> Good luck.
Are we a great team or what? We had our moments. Moments? I think we got a series here, all right? I'll call you. We were a pretty good team, too. Right. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm on my way. Ken. Enjoy your fishing trip. We are a good team. Now send us some fish. <laughs> Father, really, officer. Yes. Yes, he does. Whoever he was, Miss Westbrook, he never got inside the safe. The metal's got a few scorch marks on it, but uh, it looks like the lock wasn't even touched. No thanks to you. How did he get past security? Uh, we're working on it. Well, work on it on your own time, because you are fired. Alana, we don't even know how it happened yet. Stu's worked for us for five years. Look, I don't care how it happened. It's time for a change. Alana, I have those contracts for your signature. Uh, later, they Scott. You were going to choose the girl for the national advertising campaign. Oh, not now. Oh, Lana, this is the third day they've been here. All right, all right. I think we can do better. Girls, I'm really sorry. Thank you, ladies. If there are any future opportunities, I have your numbers.
somewhere out there, there is a girl with the perfect look. Well, at least the formula is safe. That's the important thing. Yeah. And it is going to remain safe. That's why I'm taking it home. Home? Oh, Lana, you can't do that. The formula is too valuable. Well, you can't stop me. As CEO, I have a responsibility to the company and to your stockholders. You're going to do what you're told, Barbara, just like everyone else around here. You are constantly undermining my authority. If you won't let me do the job you hired me to do, then why don't you let me out of my contract? So you can become the CEO at Winston Cosmetics? Who told you? Oh, Scott is a very efficient and well-connected executive assistant. I want out, Alana. I want out. Oh, I understand. I understand Winston offered you $200,000 a year plus bonuses. Very generous. Too bad you already have an ironclad contract with me. Mrs. Westbrook? Dr. Shell, as I'm sure you've already heard, there was a break-in last night. An attempt was made to steal the ingenue formula. Yes, they didn't get it. I know, but uh, I'm going to take sole responsibility for its security. That's why I'd like you to turn over all your notes and files on the project. I, I don't understand. You don't have to. Just open the cabinet. Well, Mrs. Westbrook. Doctor. Now. Mrs. Westbrook, don't do this to me. These files represent years of work. They're irreplaceable. Without them, I would never be able to reconstruct the formula. You don't have to. I told you, I'm going to make sure it's safe. Lana, I do not think it is fair that you retain sole possession. Doctor, I own that patent. Now, you developed the Ingenue formula as a salaried employee under my supervision. If you don't know what that means, I will be very happy to have my attorney explain it to you. All right. The cabinet. Everybody out. Thank you. Scott, I want you to call a press conference. Alana, I don't think the press is going to be that interested in a simple robbery attempt. Oh, I have a much bigger story than that. I'm going to tell them things even you don't know. In fact, this is a product so revolutionary that the competition actually sent burglars to try to steal it. Fortunately, they didn't get it. Are you telling us people are committing industrial espionage just to get their hands on some new wrinkle cream? Oh, no, 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 no. This is much more than that. This is an entirely new discovery that I've developed and I've tested on myself. I call it Ingenue. Remember that name. You know how most women lie about their ages? I know I always did. Well, today I'm finally going to tell you the truth. In fact, I'm going to show you copies of my birth certificate and my family records to prove it. Are you going to tell us that you're really 20? No, no, au contraire. Janice? Is this for real? Check it out for yourself. The original of that birth certificate is on file in Porterville, Colorado, where I was born. 62 years ago. Alana, what are the ingredients in this new wrinkle cream? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, that's certainly a triumph for you, my darling. Oh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, uh, please sit down. You know how I hate to have people read over my shoulders. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. I'm sorry. You know, I can't help feeling concerned about this formula being right here in the house, particularly after they tried to break into your office. 
Well, the formula's in my safe. You, of all people, should know how hard it is to get into my bedroom. Oh, come on, damn it. A lot of that isn't funny. Arthur, I'm talking about the security system. You have gotten so short-tempered. I used to be able to turn to you for, for help, for guidance, for support. Yeah, for money. It was never just the money, Arthur. But now all I get from you is whining. Snide little rat. Who? Harley Griswold. This time he has gone too far. What did he say? Uh, never mind. Eric, have my car brought around in five minutes. Yes, ma'am. Are you going? Wait, the caterer is coming with designs for the birthday cake. Uh, that's all right, that's all right. They know what I want. And uh, uh, don't bother to wait up for me. I'll be late. Do you have something to do? Yes, sir. Then do it. Yes, sir. Harley, darling, are you talking about me? Alana, my angel, you don't look a day older in considering the vital statistics. That's quite an achievement. You know Beverly Courtney, don't you? How are you, darling? Harley, I want to talk to you. I'm so serious. I wonder if she's miffed because I'm having lunch with another of my lovely admirers. Oh, Harley, you're such a tease. Tease isn't exactly the word I had in mind. Have you read Shirley's column today? I have. You're in it. What did I say this time? Nothing terrible, I hope. Harley's always saying terrible things. Beverly, darling, shut up. According to a well-connected writer friend, a certain cosmetic queen's dramatic revelation of her true age couldn't have come at a better time. Rumor has it that recent financial drains have left her beauty empire teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. You don't think that I tell Shirley about your financial problems, do you? Let's see, a well-connected writer friend... Why, Harley, I do believe you are the only writer I know. And you are certainly the only person who knew that I was having financial problems. That is, of course, until this came out. Well, Lana, I swear I never said a word to Shirley. At least not that I can recall. Harley, you know, you drink too much. And darling, when you drink too much, you talk too much. Alana, my darling, what can I do to win your forgiveness? You can drop dead, darling. Beverly, I do hope you'll think twice before you tell him any secrets. You never know what might turn up in print. Too bad, do I? For my age. That cream is really a miracle. You must rub it all over your body. Doesn't it ever bother you to be sleeping with someone almost old enough to be your grandmother? I haven't even thought about it. Do you want to know what I do think about? Why don't you tell me? a very effective little job you did the other night. Well, you said you wanted the break in attempt to look realistic. 
You were right to get your valuables out of that safe. The security around here stinks. Yeah, you certainly proved that to my satisfaction. Uh, what about that other little matter I asked you to look into? Well, it took some digging, but I think I found what you were looking for. It's not going to make you happy. Oh, well, you'd be surprised what makes me happy. Oh, everything all right for the party tonight? I think so. Great. Sure you won't come? Uh-huh. Chicken. <laughs> Have a happy birthday. Oh, thanks. Oh. How's the new boat? How's your knee? Wet. The office has been trying to reach us for days. They finally got a message through to the store down the road. Important? I don't think so. Somebody named Westbrook wanted you to go to a birthday party tonight. I uh, said you couldn't go. Who's Westbrook? We went to law school together almost two years. You never mention him. Oh, five years out of law school, he went into business. Made a fortune. We were good friends. I haven't seen him since 77. How'd it go out there today? You were right. We were bitten to death. Man, yeah, didn't catch a thing. We're out of this tournament. Yesterday, the boat sank. Perry wrecked his knee, and we lost all our fish. We can go home, as far as I'm concerned. Those are mine. Alana, darling. Happy birthday. Thank you. I can't believe how marvelous you look. I just pray that when I get to be your age... Darling, don't worry. Anjana will be out soon. I do hope you can afford to wait. Alana, my angel, I've been calling you for days, but you're never home. And I never will be home to you again, Harley. In fact, you weren't invited. Get out of my house. I was getting around that I'm no longer on your list. You've no idea the harm it's doing me. I couldn't be more thrilled. Oh, darling, for God's sake, you're ruining me. And wouldn't that just be a shame? Eric! Eric, Mr. Griswold is having trouble finding the door. Please show him out. Mr. Griswold, if you please, sir. This way. Darling, I want to talk to you. Arthur, Arthur, you must show me your guns, you know. I've been learning to shoot, and I want to ask your advice on what I should buy. Well, you know, I only uh, have targets. Well, uh, what did you use in the Olympics? That's the Walter 22 right there. Huh? That's a silhouette uh, pistol. We'll have to talk about it tomorrow. Tomorrow. Happy birthday to you.
Well, good night, darling. You know, I was thinking, uh... Oh, Arthur, darling, it's so late. Not tonight. Uh, well, good night, darling. I'm uh, happy birthday. Thanks. Lana? Lana, did I hear you mention having breakfast with the uh, Esmonds today? You awake? I'm, I'm coming in. How long have you worked here? I've been in the employment of Mrs. Westbrook for seven years. From what you've been telling me, yes. it sounds like you don't like Mr. Westbrook. He didn't treat Mrs. Westbrook very well. Your name again? Eric. Eric, hang tight. I'll get back to you. As you wish, sir. Officer, I need to talk to you for a moment. I found something I think you're going to be interested in. Mind if I ask you a question or two, sir? I don't mind. Okay, to begin with, looks like a thief broke into your house, stole one of your guns, went upstairs and surprised your wife while she was putting away her jewels in the bedroom safe. Bang. He shoots her, grabs the jewels, and splits. And while all of this was going on, my guys tell me, you never heard a thing. Well, I take a sleeping pill, Lieutenant. It's very effective. I wish I had heard something. I might have been able to do something. Might have been able to do something. Lieutenant! Excuse me, sir. Mr. Westbrook, let me 
give you an update, sir, on what we think happened because something is not quite kosher. Uh, no, it's time. Well, to begin with, sir, your wife's jewels were found in a mailbox just down the street from your house. But we didn't find the formula for your wife's anti-aging cream, the one that Dr. Shell told us about. Now, that means that the thief, if there was a thief, wanted the formula and not the jewels. Which means that the thief, if there was a thief, knew precisely what he was looking for. Why do you keep saying if there was a thief? I mean, somebody broke in here. <laughs> Mr. Westbrook, nobody broke into this house, sir. What about that window? Ah, Mr. Westbrook, the window broken from the inside out. You see, the thief, your wife's killer, wanted us to think he broke into the house, but we think he was inside all along. Inside? Inside, Mr. Westbrook. In fact, we think he's still here. And we think we'll be able to prove it. Prove what? The butler says you and your wife, well, you didn't get along. Would you like to tell us about it? You should get started as soon as possible. I think you should change lures and fish the center of the lake. I was very comfortable on the dock. Oh, come on, Della. You were lucky. How about some coffee? Right away. You know, you really should get in a few hours before the sun gets too hot. Oh, Ken, Della knows what she's doing. Take it from me. <laughs> she will win the tournament. Mr. Mason, got a message for you. Head of the firm is there. Thank you, Abner. What is this, another invitation to a party? <laughs> Not quite. Arthur Westbrook's wife was shot last night. And he's been charged with murder. I thought I took care of the hair. I took care of bail. Hey, Barry. I can't thank you enough. Too early for thanks. According to the police report, your butler told Lieutenant Brock you had violent arguments with the Lannan. Oh, damn that man. He'll be a witness for the prosecution. It's too bad you didn't get along with him. Eric is a butler. I pay him to get along with me. How long were you and Alana married? Oh, almost ten years. Did you argue? Well, of course we argued. Every couple argues, for God's sake. Eric says quite a few of your arguments concern money, Alana's money. Alana's money? <laughs> I gave her every cent I have. It was a lot. I just wanted to get some of it back out of the business. Arthur, do you realize that wanting your money back is enough motive for the police? What? They haven't found the murder weapon, but they did find the shell casing and your fingerprints were on it. Well, they stole my bullets. We can't prove that. The DA does think he can prove you killed Alana to get the formula for her face cream. He'll claim you knew the formula was in her safe, and only you could have faked the break-in to throw off suspicion. Hey, what, what are you trying to do, get me more upset? I'm under arrest for murder. Thanks, Dylan. Sit down. My partner, Ken Melansky, is going to visit the crime scene with Lieutenant Brock in the morning. Before you leave here, I want you to go over all the pictures from the party with Della. But right now, I'd like you to tell me about this cream your wife invented. It really worked? Oh, yes. Arthur, how old was Alana? I haven't the slightest idea. Morning, Lieutenant. Morning, Miss Melansky. Sorry I'm late. Going in. What do we got?
Excuse me. Mind if I take a look around? Who are you? My name is Melansky. Ken Melansky. I work with Perry Mason. Mason, the lawyer? You a lawyer too, Melansky? <laughs> Don't tell me you got something against attorneys. Ever know a cop who didn't? Who said you could be in here? Lieutenant Brock. He's outside. Ask him. I will. In the meantime, don't go anywhere. Don't touch anything. Clear? You're not going to find anything, Malansky. Forensics swept the place clean yesterday. I had to tell your investigator that she acted like I was trying to sneak out with vital evidence. What investigator? Tall, blonde, nice looking. She was going to go look for you. She was just here. Just now. Yeah, just now. She just drove away. It wasn't one of yours? The only woman on my squad is Laney Rodriguez, and she ain't no blonde. Yeah, I do, Lieutenant Darius Quinn. I wrote her name and license number in the law. Lieutenant, the one that's a dead end. This is not another one of Mason's scams, is it, Melansky? Getting us running around in circles looking for some mystery woman? Give me a break, Lieutenant Perry, and I don't work that way. You know, I know that by now. After you. Arthur and I went through every picture from the party. These three knew the formula was in the house. William Shell? Mm -hmm. The chemist who developed Ajinu. Barbara Fox? Alana's CEO. And Scott Collins. Her executive assistant. You're holding one back. Harley Griswold. Arthur said that he and Alana had a terrible fight the night of the party. Fight? About what? He only knew that Harley crashed the party and Alana threw him out. Well, Mr. Melansky. Sorry I'm late. I was downtown with Lieutenant Brock. He traced our mystery woman's license plate. Rental car, phony name, dead end. She's evidently a professional. Professional enough to murder? I'm starving. Have you ordered yet? No, we've been waiting for you. Waiter! Arthur identified four suspects today. Now, tomorrow... You want me to check out that break-in at Alana's offices because it's connected. You're finished with everything else. Everything jibes with the official police report. Well... Rock is certainly putting together a good case against us. I just got a glimpse of him going down the hall, all in black with some kind of mask over his head. That's all I saw. This intruder, you think it could have been a woman? I don't know. I didn't think about it. In other words, you wouldn't say yes and you wouldn't say no. I'd say maybe. More than that, pal, I don't know. Mr. Collins' office is around the corner down the hall. Great, thanks a lot. Projects like the party, occasional dirty tricks, stabs in the back. Whatever Lauren Kent was doing, Alana kept secret. Well, she doesn't work for Mrs. Westbrook anymore. Now, what was she doing here? She said she had some loose ends to tie up. So do I. You know how I can find her? Well, her employment file's in the computer. bring her up. Her file's been erased. 
Could she have gotten her hands on one of those terminals? Well, there's another one in Mrs. Westbrook's office. When she was in there, I... You don't think that she could have erased it herself, do you? Now, there's a thought. Did you pay her by check? She picked up her last one today, yeah. You have any of the canceled checks? The name of her bank will be stamped on the back of the check. Hello? I'm back, Ken. Good, Lauren Kent's here. Why should I talk to you now, Mr. Malinsky? Either here and now, Ms. Kent, or on the witness stand under oath. Suppose I just disappear. We'll find you. And then you can explain to Lieutenant Brock what you were doing at the Westbrook mansion impersonating a police officer. My name is Lauren Kent. I'm a PI. Here's my license. I've known Alana since I was a kid. I did a couple of jobs for her and then she hired me on a permanent basis. What were you working on? She had me checking out some of her employees. Alana wasn't exactly what you'd call a trusting person. Your employer is dead. Why are you still investigating? I want to find out who killed her. You don't think it was her husband? No. For some inexplicable reason, Arthur loved her. Why do you care who it was? Two reasons. First, I have this old-fashioned idea that anyone who commits a murder should be punished. Call me crazy. And second? If I solve this case, I'll never have to hustle for another job. I'll be famous, and like Mr. Perry Mason, the jobs will come to me. Does it work that way, Ken? Look, Mr. Mason, we both believe that your client is innocent. Maybe we can help each other. Have you spoken to Harley Griswold? Why? Alana was worried about him. Seems he has a temper. Seems he's dangerous when he's crossed. Well, he doesn't look very dangerous. Mr. Mason... You, of all people, ought to know just how deceiving looks can really be. That's very true, Ms. Kent. Isn't that so, Mr. Molansky? Mr. Griswold. You're sitting at my table. Yes, I know. Won't you sit down? Sit down. Thank you. Uh, Beverly Courtney, this is the uh, famous Perry Mason who is attempting to pull dear old Arthur's bat out of the fire. Thank you. Uh, you tell us about Arthur's struggle for justice. Must be an uphill battle. All struggles are uphill. Dear Arthur has such a charming personality that I'm afraid most people would be quite happy to see him in jail, innocent or not. How about you, Mr. Griswold? Do you think he's innocent or not? Well, even if he did kill Alana, who'd blame him? She treated him badly. Very, very badly. Everybody knew it. And you? Did she treat you very badly? We had our ups and downs. Oh, Holly, you're being too kind. Why, the woman was a monster. You should have heard the way she spoke to him. I never would have put up with it. 
Anything further, Mr. Mason? Perhaps now is not the time. Oh, you can say anything you want in front of Beverly. God knows I always do. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. I love a little scandal. All right. Is it true you were taking large sums of money from Alana Westbrook? Who told you that? Is it true? Well, she gave me little gifts from time to time. Gifts of cash? Well, Alana was very generous. That's how you live, isn't it? Well, I, I accept the uh, generosity of uh, some of my devoted lady friends, yes. So your falling out with Alana endangered your livelihood? I think I should probably leave you two alone after all. Thank you, Mr. Mason, for your exquisite sense of discretion. My sense of discretion was your idea. Now... You left Alana's birthday party at about 10 o'clock. Where did you go then? Home. Which is where I'm going now. Good day, Mr. Mason. Why don't we just say au revoir? I'm sure we'll be seeing each other again. I think I got us a killer. I told Harley Griswold that I have a photo of him sneaking back into the Westbrook house the night of the party. I also told him for $10,000 I'd sell him the negative instead of giving the photo to the police. You can't do that. That's blackmail. Not really, because there isn't any photo. But if he thinks there is and he tries to buy it, we've got our man. <laughs> Perry's gonna love this. Well, it's a good thing we didn't ask his permission, isn't it? Tell me something. Are you really as tough as you act? Stick around and find out. Griswold told me that he'd get the money and he'd meet me at the Grillo Center parking lot at 10 p.m. tonight. All he's got to do is show and we've got it. Oh, oh, yes. The original idea for Ingenue was mine. We met in Switzerland 20 years ago. I was in research and development, she in marketing for a Swiss cosmetics firm. We began working on an age-reversing skin product then. Did she bring you to America? Alana was obsessed with this research of mine. When she set her company up, she sent for me, made me her chief chemist. She'd be the first to tell you that my contribution to Ingenue was essential. Unfortunately, she isn't in a position to tell us anything. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Twenty years I've worked on this project. And because my notes were destroyed, I can offer no proof of my contribution or even reconstruct the formula. Alana destroyed your notes. Weren't you worried she might use that to cut you out of your share of the profits? Alana was my friend. She always dealt honorably with me in the past. I trusted her implicitly. Even though she had the only copy of your formula in her bedroom safe? Yes. You knew that's where it was? She told me herself. A lot of Westbrook trusted me, Mr. Mason, and I trusted her. I was probably the only person at the company she did trust. What about Lauren Kent, Barbara Fox? Lauren works part-time. But are you aware that Barbara Fox and Alana had a falling out the very afternoon she took the formula home? Falling out over what? Barbara had made some bad investments and covered them with company funds. When Alana found out, she threatened Barbara's career. If you're looking for a motive, Mr. Mason... Possibly you should talk to Barbara Fox. 
Ingenue projects millions in profits, Dr. Shell. That's plenty of motive for any number of people. Tonight he's gonna need some repairs. Lori! Lori! Hey, we're getting in So Griswold tried to kill us. We're even. You coming? No! You can't do that! Watch me. from Schönheit Gesellschaft, and I'm leaving this message to confirm that I will be meeting your flight when you arrive here on the 19th, as per your fax. I wish you a safe journey. Goodbye. Schönheit means beauty, Gesellschaft means corporation. I know that! Griswold is meeting with someone from a Swiss cosmetic firm. Maybe he's got something to sell. What do you think? myself on my coffee. Can I take your coat for you? No, I won't be staying long. I, I take it back. A purist after my own heart. So what can I do for you, Mr. Mason? Tell me about the argument you and Alana Westbrook had the night of her party. I wouldn't really call it an argument. No? I understood she looked very angry. Well, an executive assistant either learns to take his boss's heat or he finds another job. But your relationship went far beyond work, didn't it? What do you mean? My friends have been doing a little research on your standard of living. The rent on this apartment alone is more than your monthly salary. I have investments. Mr. Collins, both your rent and the lease on your car have been paid by checks drawn on one of Alana's private accounts. So what's your point, Mr. Mason? That I'm a kept man? That Alana and I were lovers? More or less? Well, you're right. So what does that prove? That gives me a motive to want her alive, not dead. Yes, she paid for my rent, my car, my clothes. But now that she's dead, that's all over. Did you know you were extremely well provided for in her will? I don't have to answer that question, Mr. Mason. You don't have me on the stand yet. Oh, but I will, Mr. Collins. I will. Morning. Morning, sir. How can I help you? Looking for a Jaguar Mark II sedan, early 60s. You want to buy a classic Jag, do you? Come to the right place here. Actually, I'm looking for one in particular, a dented left front fender, a wing, you'd call it. Mind if I take a look through your service base? Wouldn't be one of them insurance blokes, would you? No, I'm an attorney. I'm working on a murder case. 
My name's Melansky. Son? So, I can get a court order to look through your books and your service base. But why make things difficult on both of us? Bloody lawyers. Come on. Hey, on. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah, that's it. Who does it belong to? Oh, come on, mate. There's a limit. I've got to respect the confidence of my customers. I can understand that. Mr. Griswold wants to keep this under wraps, doesn't he? If you know everything already, why ask me? Bloody lawyers. Barbara Fox. Um, my secretary told me you were waiting. I, I've been expecting a visit from you. Really? Well, ever since the head of accounting told me your Della Street was trying to get a look at the company books. You had the book sealed, Miss Fox. I was hoping I could persuade you to change your mind. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but the company's financial records are strictly confidential. But now that Alana's dead, you must control the company funds. Is that correct? Big responsibility. I can handle it. For the time being. Eventually, of course, uh, they'll be in order. With the books closed, people could imagine you might be trying to hide something. Mr. Mason, the books are in order. Ah. Uh, I'm relieved to hear that, Ms. Fox. This is a subpoena deuces taken. It requires you to be in court tomorrow morning. It also requires your books to be there. Also, das weiß ich. Herr Messen wird Sie im Sommer, wenn er in Holland im Hag ist, anrufen. <lacht> ja, ja. Dankeschön, Herr Direktor. Auf Wiedersehen. Carl Schlusner says I need to work on my accent. Anyway, Griswold faxed him there yesterday, saying he was coming into Zurich next week in order to discuss a significant business proposition involving a new product. Unfortunately, Griswold wasn't any more specific than that. His travel agency said that Griswold faxed them two days ago, requesting a one-way ticket to Zurich on the 18th. He contacted both of them by fax. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Well, I'd feel better if he'd spoken to them. Anyone could have sent those faxes. To implicate Griswold. Perry, he tried to kill us last night. That proves he's our man. Does it? I show you State Exhibit G. Do you recognize this shell casing? Ah, uh, yes, it has my mark on it, and it was found in the room where Lana Westbrook was killed. Now, is this casing similar to the ones used by the defendant for target shooting? Yes, it was compared to other bullets found in the defendant's house. That's an exact match. Were any fingerprints found on uh, this casing? Yes, the defendant's. Uh, Lieutenant, do you have an inventory of what was taken from Mrs. Westbrook's bedroom safe? Ah, uh, yes, we do. Several items of jewelry and an envelope containing a chemical formula for a cosmetic cream. But we found the jewelry in a mailbox down the street from the house. You mean the jewelry wasn't really stolen after all? No, it wasn't. And did you find the chemical formula, too? No, we didn't. So the only thing that was stolen from Mrs. Westbrook's safe was the formula for her cosmetics cream? That is correct. Now, let's talk about the broken window in the living room. The window was broken, was it not? Yes, it was. Lieutenant, when you examined the area around the broken window, what did you observe? I discovered that there was a lot more broken glass on the windowsill outside than there was on the floor inside. Indicating what? Indicating that the window had been broken from the inside out. Meaning that whoever broke the window was already inside the house? That is correct, sir. At the time of the murder, were the servants still in the house? 
No, they had already returned to the gatehouse where they lived. So who was in the house? Mrs. Westbrook and the defendant, Mr. Westbrook. Your witness, Constable. Defense has no questions, Your Honor. Witnesses dismissed. Your Honor, the people call Eric Corbell. My God, Terry, why don't you say something? So far, there's nothing to say. And what did these arguments between the defendant and Mrs. Westbrook concern? Do you recall? Sometimes they were because he was jealous of other men, but mostly they were about money. What about money? He said that she owed him. He'd given her a fortune, and now he wanted his money back. Hmm. And what did Mrs. Westbrook say to that? She'd just laugh. Tell him he'd get his money over her dead body. Your witness, Counsel. Defense has no questions. It's impossible to put a specific dollar value on it, but conservatively speaking, I would say that the ingenue formula could be worth tens of millions of dollars. Was the defendant aware of the value of the formula, Dr. Shaw? He was at the board meeting when we first discussed it. I'm certain that he knew. Thank you. Counselor, your witness. Your Honor, defense has no questions for the witness at this time. In that case, Your Honor, the people rest. Very well. Witness is dismissed. Counsel for the defense, you may call your first witness. Your Honor, uh, defense calls Harley Griswold. We ask the court's indulgence to treat Mr. Griswold as a hostile witness. The court will grant you a certain leeway, Mr. Mason. Hmm. Mr. Griswold, I'd like to direct your attention to the young lady in the second row of the spectator section. Have you ever seen her before? Yes, she came to my house the day before yesterday. And at that time, did she offer to sell you an incriminating photograph linking you to the murder of Alana Westbrook? She most certainly did not. She said she was a reporter from the National Informer and she wanted to interview me for a story on cafe society snobs. I threw her out. I can put the young lady on the witness stand if necessary. You can do what you want at your trial. I'm telling you the truth. What kind of car do you drive? 1961 Jaguar Mark II, 3.8 litre sedan. British Racing Green. Your vintage car was involved in an attempted vehicular homicide two nights ago, was it not? If you say so, it must be true. The left front fender of your car was severely damaged, was it not? Yes, it was. In fact, that car belonging to you is at Imperial Motors having that fender replaced. Is that not true? Yes, that's quite right. My Jaguar was stolen from its garage that evening. I found it the next morning, parked around the corner with just the damage you describe. You're telling us someone stole your car, smashed it up, and then returned it? Why would someone do that, sir? Well, I, I suppose someone uh, might be trying to implicate me in some way to uh, set me up in the language of the streets. Why didn't you report the theft and the damage to the police or to your insurance company? Well, every time I try to make a claim, they raise the rates. It's cheaper for me to pay for the repairs myself. Hmm. Now... We've heard testimony about the value of the ingenue formula. Isn't it a fair assumption that whoever murdered Mrs. Westbrook and stole that formula would be interested in selling it? Yes, I suppose so. But if you're going to ask me about that telephone call from Zurich on my answering machine, I promise you I know nothing about it. You have no plans to travel to Zurich to meet with representatives of the Swiss cosmetics concern? No, I don't. And after Alana's murder, why did you fax your travel agent and order a one-way ticket to Zurich? I didn't. Mr. Griswold, this is the fax that your travel agent received. It indicates that it came from your home. I wasn't at home at that time. Somebody must be trying to impersonate me. The same someone who stole your car? Yes. 
The same someone who faxed a cosmetics company in Zurich and asked for an appointment in order to discuss vital business concerns? The same someone who's trying to frame me, yes. Do you have an alibi for the night of the murder? Or for the night that your car was involved in that accident? I was at home. No, you weren't. You left Alana Westbrook's birthday party at 10 o'clock. But according to your houseboy, you didn't arrive home until 2 a.m. Now that's four hours. Four! Where were you during those four hours, Mr. Griswold? I'm not on trial here. I don't have to furnish an alibi. The witness will answer the question. Your Honor, this is a very, very personal matter. Didn't you kill Alana, Mr. Griswold? And when Lauren Kent confronted you with proof of your guilt, didn't you try to kill her also? No. Then where were you the night Alana was killed? Oh, for heaven's sake, Harley, tell them. He was with me. Order. Order. Madam, you will be seated and you will be quiet. I was with Mrs. Courtney. Witnesses? <laughs> really, Mr. Bex, there were no witnesses. You see, I'm not quite the impotent eunuch that people like to think. Dear Mr. Courtney has allowed me to spend as much time as I want with his lovely wife under the mistaken impression that all we do is gossip and have lunch. Well, thanks to you, my cover's blown. Pity. Still, it's rather nice to be out of the closet. Mr. Mason? Mr. Mason? Your Honor, defense requests a short recess. Court is in recess for 20 minutes. All right. Lauren set us up. Find her. Mr. Collins, is it not true that you and Alana were lovers? Objection. Irrelevant. Overruled. Yes, we were lovers. And when her husband found out about us, he threatened to kill her. Your Honor, may we mark these photographs for identification as defendants next in order? Yes, they may be marked collectively as defendants exhibit C. Thank you. Now, Mr. Collins, you say you were Alana's lover. Yes. Would you identify these photographs, please, Mr. Collins? They're pictures of me with a friend of mine. A young female friend, and the nature of the friendship is quite clear. Now, Alana was given those photographs on her birthday, was she not? You argued with her over those photographs, did you not? Yes. She was upset. What was she going to do, Mr. Collins? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. To make certain she did nothing, you got rid of her. Objection. Defense is badgering his own witness and attempting to introduce speculation as to motive when there's not a shred of evidence linking Mr. Collins to this crime. Sustained. Mr. Mason, that is enough. Now, do you have any more questions for this witness? Just one, Your Honor. Mr. Collins, did you kill Alana Westbrook? No. Mr. Mellers? No further questions, Your Honor. Witness is dismissed. Court is in recess one hour for lunch. All right. Damn it, why didn't you there? Just leave her alone. Leave her alone. I told you. Court. Court. Bailiff, separate those two men. I almost missed you. I can see why you weren't anxious to hang.
you stiffed us with Griswold. Get out of my way, Melissa. No, I'm not going anywhere because but you and I got to face What's the trouble, Miss Kent? Kenny, I told you I don't want to go out with you anymore. Now I'm going away. Can't you just accept that? Oh, that's that? cute. Real cute. You are the lady. Now be mature. Hey, you're totally getting the wrong guy. <laughs> you okay, Miss Kent? I am now. What you Thanks, Eduardo. I want to testify, Perry. I want to tell him the truth. Whose truth, Arthur? Yours or the prosecution's? The truth. I loved Delano. I, I could never have killed her. You were never angry at her? Oh, we had our disagreements, but... Because she was seeing another man. Scott Collins never mattered to her. She left him a small fortune from money you gave her. Well, it was her business. But your money, you must have hated her. No. But she betrayed you, made you look like a fool. Damn it, no. No, she didn't betray you or no, you weren't a fool. Just shut up. Will you shut up? Now that's why I won't let you testify. I'm sorry, Arthur. I know you didn't enjoy that. But I had to make you understand. The prosecution will play on your temper and make you look like a man out of control. Capable of any crime, the least of which is murder. My God, Barry, what are we going to do? Hey, I thought I told you to take a hike. Now we're even. Lauren, glad God caught you. Listen, I thought you should know your boyfriend was up in your apartment. I don't know what he was looking for. I do. Thanks, Eduardo. Operator, I need to make another call using my credit card. The number I'm calling is 303-555-555-4128. Thank you. Yeah, it's me. We got trouble. I think that Lori Melansky's gonna follow me here. Here, Porterville. I don't know, I think he broke into my apartment and I'm sure he found something that's gonna lead him down here. Well, I'm headed back to the house right now, but I'm afraid he's gonna follow me there. Yeah, I can do that. What road is that? Yeah, I can do that too. Yeah, I'll make sure he's behind me when I get there. Away from Denver. Guess you get a lot of cars pulling in here running on empty, huh? A friend of mine was driving up this way. I was wondering maybe if she filled up here. Tall blonde lady, good looking. Did you see her? Guess not. You take credit cards? Great. You got a restroom? Great. Why don't you pop the hood and check the oil?
Look, my name is Malansky. I'm an attorney working on a murder case, and this lady, Lauren Kent, is a crucial witness. I need to find her. Now, she was here. You must have seen her. A tall, blonde, good-looking lady. In a town like this, she'd be hard to miss. Really? All right, I'll tell you what. You tell me where she is, and I'll make it worth your while. 20 bucks. Now, where is she? 20 bucks with gas and oil. I ain't seen no woman. Great. Anybody ever tell you you talk too much? 20 bucks, I gotta get somewhere. WJ, watch the shop. I'll be back in a few minutes. Is there some kind of game to you? I can barely hear you. Where are you? Porterville. Where's Arthur? He said he was going home. Why? Perry, listen. Lauren Kent was shot and killed this afternoon. The Porterville police did a complete ballistics test on the bullets they found, and they were definitely fired from the same gun that killed Alana Westbrook. I think Arthur killed them both. Ken, that just can't be so. Well, then where is he? It was his gun and his bullets, and he had a lot to gain getting Alana and Lauren out of the way. Perry, I just don't want you going out on a limb on this. Look, Ken, once I was your lawyer. I believed in you the way I believe in Arthur. Now do this for me, Ken. Ken, are you there? Yeah. Alana Westbrook was raised in Porterville. Find out where she lived, who remembers her when she was a child... Find out what relative she has there. Get back to me as soon as... Perry? Ken? Ken? your house until 11 last night. Where were you? I panicked. I got in the car and just drove. I must have driven a couple hundred miles. Something wrong? Yes. Lauren Kent is dead. All rise. 
The Denver County Court is now in session. Judge Eleanor Harrelson presiding. Be seated. You may call your first witness, Mr. Mason. Uh, may I have a moment, Your Honor? Very well. Lauren's dead. She was murdered. We're waiting for more news from Ken. Where is he? I'm not sure. What's he doing? I'm not sure of that either. Lauren betrayed you, Arthur. I just hope Ken found something to... Mr. Mason. Uh, Your Honor, some new evidence has been found. I'd like to recall Dr. William Shaw, but I'd also like to take a short time to go over this evidence. Court will be in recess 15 minutes. That short enough, Mr. Mason? I don't know why you're asking me these questions. I had no reason to kill Alana. You and Alana Westbrook developed the ingenue formula together, is that right? To be honest, Alana dealt with marketing and public relations. I developed the formula. We started 20 years ago when we worked together in Europe. And Mrs. Westbrook used herself as a guinea pig for ingenue under your guidance, is that true? Yes. How long had she used the formula, Doctor? I believe she had used an experimental version for quite some time. Dr. Shell. How old was Alana Westbrook? I don't know. Now, I gave you two envelopes. Would you look into envelope number one, please? Now, that is the birth certificate Alana Westbrook showed to the press to prove she was 62. Do you recognize it? Yes. Now, envelope number two, please. That is another birth certificate, one which was found in the house of a woman named Lauren Kent. To whom does it belong? Alana Westbrook. According to the birth date on that certificate, how old was Alana Westbrook when she died? Forty. How old? Forty. And Ingenue never changed her appearance, did it, Doctor? Her appearance was always miraculous, wasn't it? She was very beautiful, yes. And you... You were in love with her. Mr. Mason. Yes. I loved her. Dr. Shelm, if Alana was only 40 and the face cream had not changed her appearance, then the whole thing was a charade, almost fraudulent. No, it was not a fraud. The cream just wasn't ready yet. Alana said that she could no longer afford to wait for us. She was deeply in debt. So, Lauren Kent planted that counterfeit birth certificate and those false records. That was Lauren's idea and Alana's. They said it would take the public years to realize that Ingenue didn't work. I tried to stop them. You see, Mr. Mason, <laughs> the cream really was great. The formula was almost ready. Germany, Dr. Schell, Germany. Isn't it true your father changed your family name when he and your mother moved out of Germany? Our name used to be Schellenberg. Your grandfather, Gustav Schellenberg, was a renowned marksman. He passed that skill on to your father, who then taught it to you, isn't that correct? As a matter of fact, you were a greater marksman than Arthur Westbrook. I was considered by some to be an expert marksman, yes. Your Honor, I'm momentarily through with this witness, but I reserve the right to recall him. I now call W.J. Cronkite to the stand. Mr. Cronkite, you were the one who helped Mr. Melansky find his way to Lauren Kent's house that first time, is that correct? Yes. 
You also helped him find all the evidence he just brought into court. Yes, I did that, and uh, I sure hope it wasn't against the law. Oh, I think you're in the clear. Now, Mr. Cronkite, you also overheard a long-distance telephone call made by Lauren Kent at the Porterville gas station. Could you tell us about that? Well, I I don't remember at all, but uh, she said she was going to make sure that Melansky followed her up some road in his car and that he was going to be right behind her when she got there. Sure sounded like something bad was going to happen. You know who she was calling? No, I don't know that. But I remember the number. Uh, Our phone's in terrible shape. It's kind of old. And she had to get a hold of the operator to get her call. I uh, jotted down the number. I I got it right here. Uh, Your Honor, I'd like that telephone number introduced as Defense Exhibit D. Thank you, Mr. Cronkite. You've been very helpful. I now recall Dr. William Schell. Dr. Schell, Defense Exhibit D is a telephone number called by Lauren Kent from the Porterville service station. Now, that number, 303-555-4128, is your telephone number, is it not? Yes. So it had to be you that directed Lauren Kent to drive up that mountain road to be followed by Ken Melansky. Yes. Only you had the knowledge that they were on that road, and you are an excellent marksman, Dr. Shell. She betrayed you, both you and Alana. You couldn't let her get away with that, could you? That why you killed her? She deserved it. The woman you loved, did she deserve to be killed? We were happy in Switzerland. I was in love with her. I would have done anything for her, anything. I created the formula for her. Ambitious. She was so ambitious. She left me, went to the United States and married him. I was never the same, Mr. Mason. I was devastated. When she called, asked me to be her chief chemist. I couldn't say no. I could never say no. I couldn't say no to being with her. And then she stole the formula. I was never to see her again. Can you imagine? I would have given her anything. She didn't need to do that. I loved her. I still do. But you killed her. Mr. Mason? Yes, I did. I killed her. Your Honor? The people have no objection to a dismissal of all charges, Your Honor. So ordered. Bailiffs, place Dr. Shell under arrest. Court is adjourned. Congratulations. her so much and it's funny how things can change she wasn't a very good person was she maybe i'm not much better you know purely you can't imagine what it means to me that you stuck by me 
that's what old friends are for. Yeah. Old friends. Thank you. This is the fifth one in less than an hour. Reminds me of a day in the Columbia with my grandfather. Fish were jumping into the boat. Uh, you know, it's a shame Della hasn't caught anything yet. Last time she won the tournament, and today she can't even get a bite. We're just better fishermen. Don't you think so, Della? I think if you'd untie my hands, things would be different. No, oh, ma'am, we like things just the way they are. <laughs> Whoa, got another one. So do I. When we get back to shore, you're both doomed.